I always, Ravi and I, we pick this apart every which way, but Sunday before, like for the month. And I felt like we, we kind of compared it to the draft going into this deal. And we prefaced the whole thing by saying, this time I don't think the coaches are playing possum if, because this was way before spring started, if they don't have anything definitive coming out of spring on the quarterbacks and you're going to get the collective eye roll from the fan base or angst one of the two right because i don't know if we trust them enough to go oh you mean you're really not declared because just what you said it's not it's not it's football but it's not taking guys to the ground it's not these intricate blitz packages it's not pressure packed third and seven and a lot of guys can flourish in these sorts of settings and you also don't really know about quarterbacks until they actually play. So do you is it easier to see why they haven't been overly one way or another at the quarterback position and take them at their word? Yeah, I you know, it's easy to see and and for me it was it, there was clarity before the spring. I didn't expect that Nebraska was going to say seven practices into March and April that Dylan Rayola has got the nod to start against UTIP that, 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 you know, that's not really the, the way to do it. It's one, it's not really the way to do it with a true freshman and uh, no matter what his name is. And certainly not the way that I expect Matt rule and Marcus Satterfield and Glenn Thomas to do it with a true freshman, you know, last year, the last couple of years, you know, you can, you can look back on it. Um, and Nebraska's had quarterbacks who came in as, mid-year transfers, Casey Thompson and Jeff Sims. And Thompson was named the starter before he ever took a snap in practice at Nebraska. Uh, Mark Whipple did that on the on the first day of media availability, and it might have been February, um, if not early March. And then it wasn't a whole lot different with Sims last year. Uh, when mm -hmm. Sims signed with Nebraska in December of, of 2022, right after Matt Rule was hired, um, it was apparent from rules comments that he was he was likely the guy. Um, not to say that they named him the starter right then. And also, you you can compare that situation to Dylan Raiola, and everybody but the coaches has said that he's going to be the starter and said that from the day that he uh, committed and signed with Nebraska. But um, that's a very different message than what you get out of Lincoln. And I think that's that's healthy. That's important. Um, you need to have competition. Uh, he's not taking a snap of college football and he needs to, uh, he needs to go out and, and do everything that it, that it takes to, to win that job and show that he's capable of being the starter. And if he doesn't, um, you know, then the, the whole, uh, Dylan Rayola experience maybe doesn't start on, on August 30th. Maybe it's, maybe it starts a, a couple weeks later. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I still expect that's going to be the case. I think that, that his talent is going to. Uh, to win him that job, but um, we've got to see it happen before we're, we're ready to to uh, you know analyze uh, and make predictions about how it will go. We're talking with Mitch Sherman from the Athletic. Mitch, you know, DB and I talked a lot yesterday about how different, at least in in DB's eyes and and mine as well, that Daniel Kalen has looked from high school to now in spring mm -hmm. practice with Nebraska. Obviously, he struggled some last year has looked really good in camps and other places, but they probably didn't have the senior year he wanted to have. How much impact can just this short amount of time, I mean, he's been there a couple months really, have in terms of the coaching difference, whether it's just the the learning styles or whatever it is for Daniel Kalen. Like how much impact can that have in such a short period of time? Because it, anecdotally, it appears to be dramatic. Well, if he's if he's playing extremely well and picking up the offense, hitting receivers the way that we saw in a again a very small window on Tuesday, if that's what he's doing the entire spring, and then he's also getting that done in the meeting room, and you know I know that Nebraska's happy with the way that he handled himself in the interview setting last week. Again, that's a, that's a small thing, but but, but, but wait, 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 part of being a quarterback. Part, excuse me here, Mitch. I'm sorry, but is it so when you say that isolated? Yeah, that's kind of small. But could I convince you? And I'm not here. I'm not selling anybody. I'm just trying to put the the growth and the development together in terms of the chain. 
How about if you go back to how he handled the whole mm-hmm. Dylan Rayola commitment versus coming back into the fold from Missouri and still continuing to champion mm-hmm. Nebraska's recruiting class? That's that's a Start microcosm become... of his. It, that's a microcosm of his personality too, right? May, maybe he was showing us more about who he really was than we were really to give it credit for because we didn't love his senior year. I think he showed us a lot going back a year ago from it was a year ago this time when the writing was on the wall. Um, well, even more, longer than a year ago, it, it, you know, you're talking like February of 23 when there was writing on the wall that were Raiola was serious about Nebraska and Daniel didn't want to wait anymore and he didn't burn any bridges. He handled things diplomatically. He committed to Mizzou. He did. He said the right things. He handled that the right way. And then, um, and then, and then later on, way way down the road, when uh, when, when Dylan committed to Georgia, actually, you're you're into May at that point. Um, he handled it very well again, and in how he switched his commitment from Missouri to Nebraska and immediately became the, the champion for Nebraska's recruiting efforts and, and was, I think, the instigator in that June push for Nebraska to secure the, the vast majority of its class. He was on campus every weekend helping recruit uh, offensive and defensive players. And, yeah, I think that's all very much known and, and not forgotten by the Nebraska coaches. And then you fast forward to December and the way that he handled Raiola coming back surprisingly at the end. And, you know, he took a couple of days, Danny did to think about things, but in the end it, it all, he, he, he came out of it looking, looking very good. And now here he is in the spring um, practicing well. So yeah, at that point, I do think Damon, you're looking at a larger um, series of events than just one Tuesday in practice where he hit a couple passes. They're happy with Danny. They like what he's doing. Um, fact of the matter is, they like what Dylan's doing too. And they really like how he looks. And they've got an interesting situation. I don't even know if it's a situation, but it's an interesting dynamic and a comparison between the two. And, you know, I, I think at this point, and someday, this, you, you probably won't be able to say this, but I think at this point, it couldn't have worked out any better with these two quarterbacks. We're only at April 11th, though, so there's a long way to go. Mitch, it's interesting that you said that because I've been thinking a lot about the lack of quarterback competition we've had at Nebraska for the last 12 years almost. I mean, it pretty much went straight from Taylor Martinez to Tommy Armstrong to Adrian Martinez, all as long-term three- to four-year starters, and I, if I'm not misremembering, there was never really a guy that challenged. It just depends on how you felt about the Jebbia Martinez thing, but yeah. considering Martinez was handpicked. And then Jebbia bounced before the start of uh, Adrian's freshman year. Yeah. I mean, there really hasn't been a competition seemingly to what we could be in store for. Could th- I mean, you kind of said it, this might have worked out better than anyone even planned. Is it possible that this ends up making – both guys better because i think the lack of competition in the quarterback room has actually been a problem well we saw what happened between the freshman and sophomore year for martinez and he had to go back and kind of eat the the body type change and i mean how few reps that he actually got live like yeah uh, there's something there's something to that yeah i mean i think there was a real competition in the spring um in frost's first spring with tristan jebbia and Mm -hmm. and martinez tristan he, he transferred out like two days before the season started so that played out and Martinez won the job and then the competition fizzled and there was really n- never any more competition for Adrian the rest of his, his time at Nebraska, which, yeah, I think you can you can make a case that that wasn't great. Um, it has been a long time. It, it, you know, it, it would probably go back to Mart- Taylor Martinez redshirt freshman year when he somewhat surprisingly won the job in a, in a battle with Zach Lee. But mm-hmm. You know, at that point, you think back to the way the previous year went with Zach Lee um, offensively, and you had a dynamic guy in, in Martinez. So, it, it, anyway, that was a long time ago. I I do think that these that these competitions, when they're real, that they do benefit everyone involved. Um, 
uh, they have the ability to benefit everyone involved. We'll, we'll see if we'll see what this is. I don't think we even know what this is at this point because right now the competition at really every spot in Nebraska camp is kind of baked into what they're doing. You know, you see it with the spring league, you see it with the way that they structured mat drills and and um, commitment week and everything that Nebraska, the way that it structures the off season, they're just they're just creating competition everywhere. But for it to be a true competition, I think you've got to have a couple of players or three players who are on somewhat equal footing with their ability and their talent. And, you know, we'll see if that's what we're dealing with here. Um, mm -hmm. I think in, in August, it'll be more clear right now throughout the spring, the way the spring game is going to be staged. I, I don't know that we you're going to have a great sense of whether this is a competition or it's just an inevitability um, for Raiola to get named the starter. Mitch, let's take quarterbacks out of it because we talk about quarterbacks all the time. So I, I want to kind of focus on some other position groups here. Is there a position group, maybe excited is the wrong word, but that you kind of look at the potential of and you, and you kind of look at what they're bringing back and you say, that group could be really, really good. Well, I'll give you two. Um, one that I expected to be really good. And then one that now I'm kind of looking at it and maybe reassessing. Um, I'll start with that one, and it's the wide receivers. Um, I think there's more there than what Nebraska had a year ago. Quite quite a bit, quite a bit, potentially quite a bit more. And that that group was just blasted by injuries last year. But um, the way that Nebraska remade it, and, and I think that I think we're going to look at Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nair in a few months and say that Nebraska went two for two in the transfer portal on that group. I think both of those guys are going to do good things for the Huskers in 2024. Not to say that like they're both all Big Ten or anything like that, but like they're going to be in the rotation at the top, close to the top of the rotation. And, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, 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 and I'm, again, seeing a small sample size here. But from what we've heard and seen on Banks and what we've seen now on Nair, I was impressed with him. On, He's on unbelievable Tuesday. right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think you're far off at all. Yeah, I think both those guys are, are going to do good things for Nebraska. And I think Barney um, is somebody who can play as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And Demetrius Bell, I've heard about a lot now. Um, he's dinged up right now and wasn't practicing on Tuesday, but Andy. it's not a major major injury. And, and he's, he's electric with the ball in his hands. And then you've got the four guys. Well, he's one of them. Um, the other three guys who were true freshmen a year ago, and Jalen Lloyd has taken his his abilities and, and, and game to the next level. Um, Malachi Coleman has the has the opportunity to do that when he gets yeah, we, back. We've out we've there. had all these conversations about wide receivers, and Coleman hasn't even been. You know, he's yeah. There's a lot we haven't had to say. And Jaden Doss can be somebody that really helps them. You know, Alex Bullock can be a reliable guy in doing. And if you put him in a role where he's doing what he's what, what he's best doing, then I think he helps your offense more than last year when they asked him to do more than than what is his his strength. So that's a group that I would say has kind of snuck up on me as um, having the possibility of being uh, very good or better than expected in 24. And then, and then the defensive line, um, which I knew going into camp, mm -hmm. uh, was a strength of this team. I think it's the best position group on the team, just like the most fleshed out um, talent, size, experience. They've they've got a little bit of everything or a lot of everything in some cases. That's Mitch Sherman from The Athletic. Mitch, we appreciate you joining us right bright and early this morning. Uh, really good stuff there that I'm sure we'll dig into the rest of the show. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your lovely little whiskey tasting room you got going on there. I love it. Thank you. Thanks for making room for me, guys. I appreciate you, Mitch. Thanks. That's Mitch Sherman from The Athletic. Coming up next, lots to dig into there yeah. as well as reset the show. a yeah. lot else going on on the show. All That's right. DB. I'm Robbie Lula. We'll be back with more Herd at Sports Radio. Hey, we're back here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Sounds a lot more professional. We did this in backwards order. That's true. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We are here at Herd at Sports Bar and Grill on the Pillar Exterior Stage. DB is going to put way too much salt in his drink, as he always does. I am not. I am not. And I'm going to get PTSD of uh, gargling with salt water when I was a kid. To... Yeah, old school, right? That was the remedy. Yep. Try yeah. to... Oh, you got a sore throat? Oh, gargle with salt water. Never mind. I feel fine. <laughs> that, I'm that, good. I'm that, good. I'm good. That and Robitussin. <laughs> right. So the other thing was, and this might be an India thing. 
castor oil? Uh, no, my dad would make fennel tea. Yeah. So do, I think that's an India thing. No, because do you know the only time I use fennel? When you're sick? No. When? Do you know what fennel is in that I have? Sausage? Yes. Yeah, yeah, fennel sausage. Yeah. yeah. Like so by it's, it's, you can put it in breakfast sausage by itself, and it is fantastic. By itself, it's quite bad. It, it stinks. And it tastes like black licorice a little yeah. bit oh, if you yeah. bite into it. Uh, but my, so my dad, this is why I don't like hot beverages. Is that why you grew up on, is that why you love Sambuca? I'm kidding. <laughs> Rude. Um, <laughs> no, so. That is a Zoe response <laughs> if I've ever heard it. Well, uh, I mean, you know I'm a child, so. Rude. <laughs> I'm like. What's the Zambuca milkshakes? Yeah, I'm sure if you put that in milkshakes, you'd be knocked. <laughs> People light Zambuca on fire. Yeah, it's mildly disgusting. Horrifying. Um, what's worse, that or Everclear? Um, oh, give me. Given the choice, <laughs> I'll I'll take the Everclear. Man, I can't I can't go anywhere near black licorice. Oh no, it's terrible. Yeah. It, but so my dad would make I us... can I can gut the gasoline. <laughs> Dude, it's so bad. Oh, I know. My friend's wife, one time, we were ha- he had a, a holiday party, and so we were doing shots of peppermint schnapps, which is not great in and of itself. My, uh, equally, but it's, equally disgusting. But it's fine. Like, I, can, I, know what, I know what to expect. I know what I'm getting. But it's, it's just a clear alcohol, right? Mm-hmm. Well, as a joke, she switched mine out for Everclear. Yeah, that's not fun. After the first shot, I, I almost got sick instantly. Like, the moment it hit my stomach... Mm-hmm. You're expecting peppermint, and you get paint thinner. Yeah, shocker. And that's I, not that's not a good friend. Are you guys still? Yeah, we're cool, but it was. Yeah, we'd have to have some speaks. I was. It's. It might be the meanest thing she's ever done to me. Yeah, that's tough. I'm not a fan. We'd have to reevaluate our it, positions. It was. <laughs> it was not great. It's a mean thing to do to it, people. It is. Um. Anyway, I don't know how we got on that. Uh. Oh, but yeah. So my dad would make fennel too when we get sick, and so every like hot beverages now remind me of yep, being I sick don't, i don't drink anything hot i can I do a hot cocoa that's it nope i generally don't i'm out i drink because i'm thirsty or i need it <laughs> so <laughs> i just don't know <laughs> that coffee or tea or or anything else fits that bill i'm out i'm drinking to try and stay awake in the morning with my energy drinks you know I gotta... yeah I've, I've been reading all these reports on some of these energy oh they're drinks. terrible they're not you. they're yeah, they're not no. what people think i'm here for a good time not a long time db <laughs> Sounds like, no, <laughs> dude, that is a total Mosman line right there. That, I know, that's, that's Oklahoma Tyler. That's why we get along. Yeah, that's my guy. He's, he's talk, talking about like savings and stuff. Well, for what? <laughs> I for what? Listen, I like having a little bit in savings, but I'm not one of those people. Like, there's a lot of people that used to be in my life that are all about like the Dave Ramsey thing. Yeah, where it's like, hey, you eat rice and beans and save up. And it's like, why would I want to be rich when I'm old? <laughs> Like, what am I doing at 65, 70? Like, I'm enjoying the money. You, you could be a star on TikTok. I'm enjoying the money now. Uh, well, you're already ahead of the game because you don't have any little. 100%. Speaking of which, our guy, the the leader, the favorite for the Masters. Yeah. Scotty Scheffler, right? Oh, this is wild. His wife is pregnant. Mm-hmm. He has said, he said yesterday, I think, oh, during yeah. all the press, whatever, and the par three, which I like, and you know. I can't believe that's your thing. Now, the cool part is the kids, but I know that's not your thing. So why do you like the par three? I, it, to me, it's like a three-point contest. I just like seeing it. I like seeing the skills and just because they do goofy stuff and they try and skip it across the water. Like, I just like it. Okay. I, I mean, hey, to each his own. Yeah. I watched the Masters Live last night. and was thoroughly entertained. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just On the Golf see, Channel, they were yelling at each other. old staunch guys like. Talk about the course and, you know, and Chambly, who was notoriously anti-Tiger. Mm-hmm. Well, that's his most famous kind of like on-air yeah. battles and stuff. Now, they, But they have particular personalities. They have since these things were on mainstream television. But Chambly was talking about not lengthening the courses, make it shorter. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, you know, to make it more democratic and just to see them go back and forth. And, and I, I was just laughing, number one, because of his delivery. He was very... He had a little Ravi to him where it was like. There was an a-hole. Uh, that's a little harsh. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you meant, though. <laughs> but I mean, my man was like bothered, right? And he, he kept talking over his guys. And he, I mean, he was thoroughly pissed. But 
A little condescending. Is that the right I, word? I got, yeah, I got, oh, super snark. Yeah. And I got to thinking, I was like, shorten the course. I mean, this is like, this is Augusta. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what do they want to do? Run around and just play all par threes? <laughs> And then I had to laugh to myself on the couch because I was like, oh, that's something Robbie would enjoy. <laughs> he's he's king of the par threes. I love man. par threes. I used to play par threes all the time. <laughs> like over there, right, right off of center? Or? Yeah, I'd play the one off of center. I'd play Westwood. I'd go play Elkhorn Ridge. I'd go play Warren Swigert down on Maple. Uh, that's right. Just down the corner from. So I would, Coach Huffman and I would, I keep calling him. He wasn't Coach Huffman then. He was just Mike <laughs> or Huffy. <laughs> but we would like go on that creek and, and get, like the bikes and get. Yeah, <laughs> he had a cool one, too. But he, we would go down there and get golf balls. Yeah. So I used to, and, and we would sell, we would sell them back. We'd trade them for like snow cones and yeah, you know, back then that was like chewy, uh, chewy sweet tar- sprees. Oh yeah, yeah, sprees were a thing. I used to mess so, with sprees. Like that's what we would do. But yeah, Warren Schweiger, that's my brother used to work there. So I used to go. I used to play part because I, I like golfing. Mm-hmm. I don't like spending five hours of time doing basically anything. Right, like you go play eighteen. It's four or five hours. Like yeah. it's it's a huge part of your day. I don't understand how people with kids ever get away with it. I don't. I don't get it. That's at all. usually the first thing to go. Yeah. Stress wise, when when guys and gals can't go golf once they start a family. Yeah. It's it's just it's. Oh. I just can't justify the time. I'll be curious to see because Schaefer likes to play golf at, for a peace of mind. Mm-hmm. I'll be curious to see how he navigates that because that's typically one of the first things to go. So I instead of playing eighteen all the time, I would just go to these par threes. And I got down to where I could knock out a par three in like 75 minutes, walking it, going the nine. And so I'd go play par threes two, three times a week, have a grand old time. So my like iron game was on point. I can't drive to save my life still to this day. Um, But to this day, to this day, (laughs) you and Deontay Wilder, me and Wilder to this day. I get it. Uh, No, but our guy, Scotty Scheffler, his wife is pregnant. He said, if she goes into labor, he's leaving. And my thought, I'm thinking two things here. Number one. That has to affect the betting odds. Has to, right? I, especially as a as a as the clear face. Yeah, he's like plus. And, and a guy says, "Hey, I, I could bounce at any time." I don't know what I would do. See, that's right. what I wanted to ask you too, because you're a dad. I'm not. It's a relative term. <laughs> you have father children. I have not. Correct. That I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> At least that you know of. that nobody's told me. Yep. Don't uh, get don't get that knock. It's tough. <laughs> not a phone call. I'm looking to get. Um, but so, because me, I'm like, okay, listen, I I probably need I probably need to stay and finish this thing. <laughs> I I would guess that's how you would feel. I don't know. It just depends. Like if you know, does it depend on which kid it is? If it's first versus third, you'd have to go back and explain that later. So no, okay. Because um, I've heard other people, but say, I would say the this is uh, this is kind of double talk, but not. I wouldn't discern between the second and the third, mm-hmm. but the first is definitely a standalone. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like if it's your first kid, yeah, you know what I mean? It makes more sense to me to be like, I got to go. And it depends on what, it, like, did you marry somebody that says it's okay? No big deal, but really it is a big deal. Or somebody that actually doesn't, or somebody that deal. says, no, I want a nice gift and it matters. Yeah. Right. Because if it's not a guessing game and they shoot you straight, that helps a lot. It, well, at least it lets you know where you're at. Yeah. F- for me, I just don't know if I would be able, especially in a sport like golf, mm-hmm. where it's, I mean, you you constantly have to stay second to second. Locked in. I mean, locked. Yeah. I just don't know. You, you know what I mean? But but I'm also. Does it matter where you're at in the standings? Like, if he's leading I, this thing by a couple I'm, strokes I, I, on a Saturday and he gets the call. Like if he's versus if, if, he, he's, if he if he's minus seven uh, halfway through the third round and he's up five strokes, you got to finish that thing. And he says he's bouncing. You got to um, finish that thing. I wonder if Vegas has a contingency if he does. Like you withdraw. get the like it's like a, a no bet basically. Yeah, maybe because all because they can they can do that. Yeah, hundred percent. They get they basically can do whatever they want. I mean, th- and this is coming from a guy. Uh, Zoe was born on a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. We were in Des Moines for a basketball tournament on Sunday. Yeah, and we all went. <laughs> so don't don't let me kid you. Like I'm Mr. Family Man. I wanted to see everybody. Well, you all went. So kind of. <laughs> That's CBM Ravi Lula Moore. Heard at Sports Radio coming up next. Wrapping up hour number one here on Heard at Sports Radio and 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. 
We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior stage. I wanted to get into defensive line here a little bit because we talked to Mitch about this. And I wanted to get the positional breakdown of defensive line yesterday. Show got away from me a little bit. <laughs> no way. I, I got to tell you this still with my butt. Yeah. Remember I told you, like, it, it depends on how well you, you – you, you, how honest your spouse is with you. Mm -hmm. My buddy is every time I go fishing, she says it's okay. When I get home, it was never okay. That's the worst. No, it's the worst. Cause it's, you're playing I, like you're playing battleship. You're just shooting at a target. You can't I, see. I, I'm telling you, there's I'm not about that. And there's a lot of other things I can, I can handle and, yeah. and deal with the, the guessing game or the inconsistency of not shooting me straight. It's the worst will never fly. No, because you can't ever beat somebody's mind. Yeah, you can <laughs> never. And you always feel like you're on eggshells it's and like, you can never be right. Uh, that's, that's It's honestly, it's the same thing with And this is a weird analogy, but it's the same thing with coaching, right? If coaches don't clearly it, set their expectations of what they want from you, then you're always playing a guessing game and you're trying to meet their mood, yeah. which is a disaster. And, and it's funny, too, because in relationships, a lot of times with, with athletes and non-athletes or two athletes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times conflict resolution boils down to those those points. Yeah. Like, and, and sometimes when you have two athletes, it can be uber tough, yeah. even though you have commonality in terms of, okay, you're used to somebody telling you, this isn't good enough right now. This is what I need you to do in order to be better. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, you're pretty good at this. Don't rest in that. Stay on the game. Like things like that, that people that haven't competed have no, have no frame of reference. Yeah, you have to go through a good amount of counseling if you haven't competed for that to be a thing that you can handle. We just had this conversation yesterday, two days ago at the dinner table, in a couple meeting rooms. There are a couple of coaches that have a specific kind of delivery. Mm -hmm. And it was like... Oh, that sounds harsh. And Caleb was like, no, I mean, that's just that's just being coached. Mm -hmm. And immediately I perk up. I'm like, yes, that's how <laughs> I feel. Like, but if you're never in that arena, if somebody says that about your skill sets or the way you look or you need to get in shape or mm -hmm. like it can be it, it can be traumatizing, but at the end of the day, the more consistency there is in the message from the coaches, mm -hmm. like you at least know what you're dealing with. You at least with. know where you stand. Yeah. And you and, may not like I, the delivery. You may not love the feedback, <laughs> but at least you know where you stand yeah. with them. Yeah. You might not even agree with them, dude. That's but at least you, at least you know. Totally me and my dad. Totally. How, in what sense? Because, and he said this early, and I didn't get it until probably uh, it's late in elementary so early but late it's probably mm -hmm. fifth sixth grade and he would always say don't ask me the questions you don't want to know the answer to mm. you know because he would say some things and i'm like man but i don't feel good or i don't want to go or man that helmet is ugly i'm not wearing that <laughs> or those shoes look cheap yeah you know and he would say things like well, you can go with Velcro or you can go barefoot or, you know, the time I forgot my helmet at home and I didn't want to wear the leftover. Mm -hmm. And I, and he's coaching. Right, I mean, we're at the Gladiators. And sure enough, man, I sat I sat in the car and watched practice because there was. There was no contingency plan. This is what I told you. It's up to you to deal with it or not. You forgot your helmet at home mm -hmm. this is how it's going to go down and i and i used to resent that and it's crazy because over time i'm exactly that way because <laughs> i think i've convinced myself that it works so if coach coop can say nah, i'm not going to give that example if if he can be that direct and you as a player who's trying to show that you have command of the skill and it's not good enough and he tells you why it's not good enough and it's for the whole room to hear if that's the culture that's the culture mm -hmm. at least there's no uh, do i don't i like you know if you raise your hand you know what's at stake yeah 
right? Yeah. And if you don't raise your hand, you know what's at stake, right? <laughs> so it's like, well, and you know where you're at. And and it's it's interesting that you bring up Coach Cooper too, because there's also a part of it, especially when whether it's kids, whether it's new in a relationship, whether it's with coaching where it's on the person delivering in, on the information at some point mm -hmm. to understand, oh, this isn't landing the way I want it to, right? So, like, I was I was talking That's to... That's where I tell you his discernment is key. Yeah. Coach Rule, unbelievable discernment. Well, and so I was talking to uh, our friend Avery over at Herd at Sports, who was down at practice on Tuesday, and she, she told me the story about Coach Cooper, and they were doing this scoop and score drill, mm -hmm. right? And he kept... Ah, we stole that one. <laughs> And he kept part saying, of the turnover circuit. He kept saying, "Step to the side." Yeah. yeah. And so every he, he's telling he's telling somebody, "Hey, step to the side and then go." Yep. Step to the side. So he's saying it to every single guy. None of the guys are doing it the way he wants mm -hmm. to do it. And so he rips one guy for it, and then he watches about ten more guys do it the wrong way, and he's saying, "Step to the side, step to the side, step to the side," every single time. And then, then at one point, and this because uh, Avery was watching, mm -hmm. she go he goes. Hey, let me tell you what I mean by when I say step to the side. Because it was clear <laughs> they weren't getting it. That whatever he meant was not what they were hearing, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you can't hear somebody say step to the side a hundred times in a row and not just be so annoyed that you're going to step to the side or do whatever you think step to the side means. Mm -hmm. Like my first week playing college basketball, we're playing pickup ball with the returners, whatever. And my point guard, who I loved to death, I ended up coaching under him for about 10 years. My point guard kept telling me, show on the screen, show on the screen, show on the screen. We're playing defense. Hey, show, show, show. Finally, after about 10 times, I'm like, man, I don't know what the f you mean when you say show. And he goes, wait a minute. You said that out loud? Yeah. Like the F word? Yes. At Nebraska Christian College. It didn't what, is, go over. what is wrong with you? I'm a little loose. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, what? <laughs> I go, I don't know what you mean. And he goes, oh, all right. This is what I mean when I say show. And I was like, oh, I call that a hedge. And he's like, I call it a show. And I was like, cool, we're, we're good. So you know what's funny about that? It's, it's the same thing. It was a particular, and again, it happened to be DBs. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt kind of bad because it was a younger guy. Mm -hmm. He had to do the rep. We got to about seven, eight times in a row. Mm -hmm. And it is a physical drill. Yeah. It is It is a block destruction drill. You got to bring your hands and wrap up. Mm -hmm. And it was so subtle. Hey, not hop, hop. We do short, short, long. He kept saying it over. Hey, not hop, hop. Not hot, hop. Coach Cooper stopped talking. Isaac Gifford was the next guy in line. Mm -hmm. He kept saying it over and over. And after like the fourth time, Gifford was the one to say, do it again. Coach Coop, Co Coach Coop didn't have to say a word. Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, do it again. Hey, no, no, do it again. No, not like that. Do it again. Then Gifford demoed it. No, no, do it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? Here's the deal. Not only did said player receive it, mm -hmm. Gifford taking – he took the pressure off his coach because he's an extension – of his coach yeah because at and a certain point as a coach if that's you what you keep, want if, well not not only is that what you want because they're taking ownership of the standard right but also it's really hard to not look like a jerk when you have to tell the same guy to do the same rep because he's messing it up eight times yeah. in a row yeah. and you still have to do it mm -hmm. if your guys aren't ready to take that ownership yet mm -hmm. but then it become then you have to go really intentionally back to that player and build them back up because whether you intended to or not in that moment, you were tearing them down yep. or it felt like you were mm -hmm. tearing them down. So the fact that Gifford goes and takes some of that pressure off of Cooper is an enormous it's, thing. It's unbelievable. For I, the temperament of the team. I had to get some bottled water from Costco the other day mm -hmm. uh, is right after I had Nebraska gear. On. Mm -hmm. So a guy was coming. I was leaving. I was in there all the 12 minutes. I went and said hi to my, my girl, Lucy, who is like the best <laughs> self checkout person ever. Never take, never makes me take anything big out of the cart. <laughs> she's like, she's always asking about the, she's just cool. But anyway, so I'm leaving, he's coming and the guy was like, hey, you know, he, he said something about um, when to report and he goes, hey, I'm such and such. I'm, I'm good friends with Dave Jones. I was like, oh yeah. I said, you know, good guy. And we mm -hmm. started talking about Christian. 
and he's talking about recruiting and i said ah he's going to be a tricky recruit because he's not your average he, he's he's he reminds me of Caleb. i'm like these guys are different <laughs> and i said we start talking about his attributes i said you know my favorite thing about him now is now that we have this trust he's an extension of my right hand i can give him minuscule very minimum feedback mm -hmm. hey get to the face of one get underneath that's you close and he'll say it so when he's not getting the rep he can tell the next young guy hey face he'll he'll do face face of one mm -hmm. or i'll say hit and sit right don't be in a hurry to get away from number two if two's not going anywhere you don't have to either mm -hmm. and he'll say hey relax he's not going anywhere right so the more he can do things like that with young guys mm -hmm. It takes a lot of pressure off of what we're doing. 100%. So, like, that's ultimately the goal. So, I, I think recognizing the, the teaching is one thing, but the players trusting that it's right is probably the first. Oh. Right? Yeah. It, during one of those turnover circuits, Coach Rule is talking about, like, squeezing the ball to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Why you don't scoop score. Why you just don't try to get your hands on any tape? Flatten it, pick it up. Flatten it, pick it up. Mm -hmm. You start seeing clips of guys that could potentially get turnovers and they don't. And then the very next couple of plays, something bad happens. Something bad happens. Yep. Like they'll do the same thing over and over. And I love it because at some point you'll trust that that technique will work. That's CB. I'm Rob Lula. More Heard at Sports coming up next here on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. This one feels particularly appropriate. Game preparation and repetition predicts success and winning. Drivers and vehicle passengers who always use their seatbelts will increase their survival chances if a crash should happen. Make it click from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. And uh, we, you know, we can get a little, get a little out of pocket on the, uh, on the, on the YouTube comments sometimes. Who's acting up now? Oh, uh, you know, it's TK always. Um, he's, he still wants us to get to the D line. So let's get to the D line. All right. Uh, it was one of my favorite groups last year coming out of spring. And I, I feel like I was in the minority there. <laughs> Crazy. I know. <laughs> but there was a lot of, I mean, so we didn't know that Ty and Nash were going to play like that. We didn't know what to expect out of Cam Lenhart and Prince Will. And I think all of those guys at least exceeded the majority of people's expectations. And that gave us a surprisingly good defensive line last year. The question now is, can all of those guys take that to the next level to go from surprisingly good to actually good mm. right because there's a there's a difference then there's a difference from being good compared to expectations and just being good right there were times earlier in the year we were talking about nebraska basketball they were good compared to what we expected then we got to i don't know january february like oh maybe they're just good right maybe this is just a good group and maybe maybe that defensive line got to that point last year but we're adding I mean, Riley Van Poppel played some last year, but he'll be, I think, a big part of what they're doing this year. You've got, um, you've got uh, Maverick Noonan should be a part of the equation this year, uh, and then you've got. I saw him. I was getting. Well, it doesn't matter what I was doing, but <laughs> I was going down the ramp, and he was going up the ramp. And uh, I just had to give him a love hug. Just, I mean, he's got the big smile and the free flowing locks, but he looks spectacular. Yeah. Not, not that his frame mm -hmm. was not outstanding to be. I mean, he left yeah. Elk South looking like a dude. Uh, but you know, he had to say he had to come back from like rehab is a lonely place. Oh, it's the worst. Uh, I would. I, I'm close to probably thinking that. Like it's 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 pretty bad. It's it's, it's the worst by being exaggerated. It's but it's, it's, bad. it's a lone it's a lonely place, especially if you're redshirting because of that, and you're just because you're away from the team so yeah. much. Now you know, and and sometimes it's it's luck of the draw too. Like who am I rehabbing with? Yeah. Like who else got hurt that I'm going through this with every day? Shoot, man, to see Buford and and Singleton together. See, that wouldn't be a bad rehab no. partner. Yeah, you got 
position group, like-minded, yep. similar skill set. Yep. You guys both know you're going to contribute. It's not easy, but it's easier it's better. It's better. than kind of being on an island with somebody that's not with you and you know that you got to go play catch up. Mm -hmm. Right. So that unto itself can be it can thin the herd. Oh, yeah. Right away. So don't uh, don't ever undersell or assume because we do it as fans all the time. Oh, man, when they get back healthy. Now, you got to get there, man. Like, well, and another guy, uh, Brody Tagaloa. Yeah. Who I yeah. think they were excited about before the car. Come, it was the car accident. Come right? a long way, man. Like that's a guy that if he's able to return to where he was, <laughs> I've watched him pretty close. Um, and, and so there, there's, there's, you know, there's obviously some work to be done there. But like rehab is, especially now that I think it's back to the rigor. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not practicing. It's zero fun. Yeah. And you ask some of the old heads, like, this ain't big. Like, you're not standing around watching. You have, like, your own station and group. I saw this at Iowa, and I saw it again at Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It looked miserable. Yeah. You know, and I, and, I, and I remember saying to one of the guys in Iowa City, I'm like, oh, what's, what's that over there? And they have a name for it. And they're like, oh, that's, that's that group. And I started watching them for a little bit because there were two really, really good players that weren't participating in spring. Mm -hmm. And so I just was kind of watching their movement because I wanted to, to, to just gauge it, right? And I'm like, man, I wouldn't want to be over there. No. Right? Because I knew, like, if you had to go work with Doak or some of our trainers, like, back in the day, it, it was miserable. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you didn't want to be on the Cybex machine. You didn't want to be on the... You didn't want to be in the pool. You didn't want to be in a cold tub. You didn't want to do any of that. Yeah. Right? You, you didn't want to be down in the pit, you know, rehabbing and getting back into conditioning. <laughs> like, that was <laughs> miserable, right? So it's like, yeah, I think I'd rather just stay out here and try to practice. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? For and sure. so, now you don't want to do anything to where the point where you're, you're hurting yeah, yourself. You further damage. But you, it's, it's nice and it's refreshing to understand the difference between injured and hurt mm -hmm. and also when you build such a competitive environment you get guys like nash who don't want to miss any reps or gifford yeah you, you like gifford doesn't have to be out there in the spring and he's not 100 percent healthy but dude's a headbanger yeah right so watching bugs him those are the guys that set the tone uh, wanted to get into, oh, excuse me. Brian Popple, Kai Wallen. Yeah, I wanted to get into some guys Judy. That, that didn't really play last year, mm -hmm. right? Um, I know one guy, and we, we brought up Tagaloa. Uh, I know a lot of people were high on Vincent Carroll Jackson coming in um, as well. You've got, you mentioned Kai Wallen. Elijah Judy's a super interesting one. He's, we're ready to give up on him. Yeah, I mean, me remember the whole narrative about because we were kind of hitting this string of guys that we'd gotten from the SEC and it wasn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, yeah. He's a, a highly touted Texas A and M guy. Was a guy that, and honestly, he was one of the reasons that I was high on the defensive line group. I was like, yeah, they're gonna have they're gonna have this transfer coming in. He's gonna be an impact player right away, even more so than probably being high on either Ty Robinson or Nash, right? So I'm like, ah, don't worry. He'll take one of those spots. It'll be fine. And doesn't really play a lot last year. As you said, we kind of give up on him. But then we hear his name pop back up early in getting, spring. Yeah. As well, he was oh, playing last year and it was like, wait, I, what happened so quick? Yeah. Remember Minnesota? Yeah. They're like, mm, kind of rolling through a lot of the D line <laughs> early. But I'm he like, but he, was, like a new dude. he wasn't one of those guys I thought last year that would be like an impact guy. Right? I'm, I'm one, I'm, he was in the rotation. I'm tracking stuff. with you. But and so, but you, then you hear, um, I think it was Tony White talking early in the spring, who goes, oh, he's going to be a really important part of what we're doing. He's going to be a really important part if we want to be the number one defense in the country. Hey, did you roll your eyes? No, I didn't. Because now you, now it's I like, believe him. Yeah, now it's like if he, this dude says something. Yeah. Like the Tommy it, Hill thing last year, I rolled my eyes, right? Yeah. I was like, come on. Shoot, so did everybody. Come on. <laughs> so like, did so did every. And I remember distinctly, especially early in spring practice last year, when they kept 
They're like, this I got to see. Yeah. That's what I said to myself. This I got to see. Yeah. I was so mad at that guy two years ago mm-hmm. in a particular broadcast. And and I I mean, I can tell on myself. Sure. I, mean, I, I looked at, at Sharpie and I go, there's I, I can't play with him. I was like, I don't understand what he's doing out there. I, I, I can't. I don't understand I was, why I was they keep putting him so... out there. And then I, I was <laughs> dingling. Um, and then I just remember watching him at practice because Mickey needs got like I've heard this for a long time. Mm-hmm. Heard it from Scott, I heard it from Mickey, I heard it from Chins. And it just was never kind of a thing. Yeah. And then late, he kind of showed some flashes on offense. But like at some point, I need you to top te- stop telling me how good a guy is. I need to see mm-hmm. how good he is. And and then, you know, he started off last spring in the doghouse. Mm-hmm. And then he became, it's weird, right? It's kind of what I gravitate towards because I want a success story. Mm-hmm. So I just started watching him at practice. And I'm like, OMG. Like, this is that tough love thing and, and set, excuse me, setting the standard and the expectation. Of, it's it's working. Mm-hmm. Like, it's he can take a picture of him at practice and say, who's the new guy? And it's like, oh. Uh. But you know why it works? And we've talked about this before. It's because they have invested in him as a person. Right, the whole whole list. That is the only way that works. I see. I you can't see it, so it's not always fun to talk about. But I actually think that's their greatest strength. Oh, it's. I would one hundred percent agree. It's I because you can't get away with some of the stuff that they say and do in yeah. terms of like the the rigor and the competition and the hard yep. coaching yep. and the getting after guys a little bit. Oh yeah, you can't get away with any of that at least long term. Unless there's two things, there's only two ways you can get a, uh, get away with that, and one of them we know is not true. The the one way is that you win every game. If you just win at a super high level, mm-hmm. nobody says anything till you start losing, right? So you can be Bobby Knight because you're winning national titles at Indiana in the 70s and 80s, right? You can be that guy then because you're winning at such a high level, nobody can argue with you. The other way is if you are so invested in them as people they know that whatever you say is coming from a good place. So not to go back to this, but I think what you just talked about was why I wanted you to back off of Dan Hurley. Because his the way that his players talk about him and the way that he gets them to practice, mm-hmm. it has to be more the latter than the previous. So let me get off that real quick. You don't have to go back and, and say, get I, that. You're just, you're just lighting a firework right now, so, but that's fine. Like I, you got to be able to say to MJ Sherman or uh, Judy mm-hmm. or psst, I've watched him check like Kai Wallen, right? And you say some things, and it's like he just talked to that dude like he doesn't even know him, mm-hmm. right? Like, but over time, when people trust you, you can say things like, "Listen, if you ever want to be elite, it has to start with your fitness." Mm-hmm. Get, no, yeah, you're not in good enough shape for this right now. Get a get get in get in better shape. Yeah. Get over the fitness hump. This, right now, listen, player X. We're not talking about a talent issue. Get in shape. Yeah. And it's like, like that's something totally in your control. Take care of it. But sometimes you feel like people are talking to you like they don't even know you. Mm-hmm. But they are talking to you like that. Just the opposite. Because it's because know. it's because they know yes. you. Yes. That's and that's how they'll talk to you. You built up a trust that whatever you are telling them is a in their best interest and be coming from a good place coming from a place where you want them to succeed maybe even more than they want themselves to succeed in that moment and at some point you hope it manifests itself into wins but for nash and ty to be championing and cheering on younger d linemen Mm -hmm. i told this like four or five years ago and i'd say you know when you can cheer for other people even at your own expense. And it may be at your own expense. That's when the magic happens. Yep. I just didn't. You just don't know when it's going to be. Or if it's going to be. A lot of times it doesn't happen. When you cheer for your position group. Because you know what's slowly starting to happen? It's it's weird. Like pre-practice is turned into like pre-pre-practice. <laughs> Pre-pre-pre-practice <laughs> is turned into like pre-pre-pre-pre-pre-practices. Because at some point. I I've seen it. Coach Brown started it, and I didn't even like him then. Yeah, I was like, 
well, who do these guys think they are coming out? Like, well, practice hasn't even started yet. But I know after about three practices my first year, ask any running back. Coach Solich would say, those wide receivers out there, they're not out working us. So then our practice turned into pre-pre-practice. <laughs> and instead of standing around, it was like, hey, get the bags. I'm like, ah, we ain't ready for the bags yet. Like, we're not – this ain't practice yet. Like, leave the bags where they're at. <laughs> you know? But you'd see other groups. See, when you can't beat the offensive lineman out, mm -hmm. D-line comes out a little early. Yeah. When when you see the D-line working, it's like, as a linebacking group, hey, man, let's go get down in the corner, man. They're working on their run fits and hand placement. Let's mm -hmm. go strike. When you're watching the O-line and you're a running back, it's like, oh, man, look. See how they're getting their head around their footwork? Hey, let's go work on, hey, let's go do a crease drill. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, guys are like active in all these other little pockets of the, the practice facility because mm -hmm. they don't know any better. You, you, you don't want to be the group that's like standing around. Yeah, that lets everybody else down. <laughs> you know, we were, we were talking, I think it was Micah that asked Caleb at the, at the dinner table the other day. They were talking about something in the huddle or, or whatever. And Micah's like, man, that's a lot of guys. How do you hear everybody? And, you know, Caleb just looking at him like, get get in a position where you can hear. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? So it was just like, yeah, all the things that you think people aren't picking up on that are little things that matter. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, they actually matter. That's how you can that's how you can bring in competitive people at your position. Yeah. Like you embrace it. Yeah. Right. You, if, if you can get guys to I, I'm telling you, like you. You watch that D line is big that that ethic, not only it's being birthed a lot of it. Yeah, Coach Knighton is a a true yard dog, mm -hmm. right? Like that dude will guard his yard. Even though he sounds like a CPA. Yep. But, <laughs> hey man, my man was out here the other day. I swear to goodness, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen because I know his personality. Mm -hmm. He had on a stocking cap that covered the ears and covered his mouth. And a, a hat that had like a ball on it. <laughs> like a breast, like a yeah. stocking cap. Yeah. And I'm like, Thank you. How is this big, mean spirited, funny dude out here in that? <laughs> but you watch him coach. I bet nobody said nothing to him. Man, that dude could come out there in pajamas. <laughs> and people would be like, Oh man, that's just Coach Knight. I <laughs> listen, if I'm lying, I'm dying. That that's that's how that that's how you know that's how he can get all those guys to play. Well, and that's the other thing I like about not just this defensive line, but good defensive lines in general, right? Is I feel like they can set the tone of competitiveness for your entire team, and maybe defensive line more than anywhere else because you can logistically play eight guys pretty easily, right? So it's really easy for them to be competitive with one another because. Most of those guys know, like, hey, I can still get my reps. Mm -hmm. Like, I can still get in the game here. Where it's like, okay, even an offensive line. I know they want to rotate some in there. It's usually not as fluid as the defensive line in terms of rotation. Maybe the only other group that's that fluid. Yeah, but you'll get to a standard, right? Because yes. you'll know, listen, if I'm only good for 20 snaps, hey, watch these 20. I'll say watch the 20 watch, snaps. Watch these 20 snaps but I'm about to get. <laughs> also, it always so you get the taste of what you want, yeah. and you're still working for more, right? Because imagine in that group. If you've got a guy that you have to leave on the field for 40 snaps, mm -hmm. imagine how good that guy's going to be coming out of that group. If Coach Dighton's like, I can't take this guy off the field after 20 snaps. I have to leave him in there for 40 snaps because he's that good. The competitiveness just builds and feeds off of itself. I remember Jamel Williams, and, he, and this is kind of a foreman thing too. Some of these young, really active backers, mm -hmm. like they knew like their, if their spot was special teams, Hey, watch this. Yeah. Because they were so, I don't know if offended is the word, but bothered by the fact they kind of weren't in the rotation. Now, mm -hmm. keep in mind, you could have been a freshman or a redshirt freshman playing behind a third year junior, right? Yeah. An All American. Like, or I'm all not, I, I, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. It, yeah. It, it was deep. But it's the whole reps thing. If, if you're only going to get a certain amount or this is what you're going to do, mm -hmm. you, you'll get to the point because it's such a competitive arena that it'll be the best you got. And some guys, they know that they're only going to be found maybe on, do you hear Coach Foley talking about when, when like D-line or guys come in and say they want to be on special teams? Mm -hmm. You set the standard. I'm going to give you four or five things, four or five minutes. That's it. We're moving on. Like 
you either you want to do this or you don't. Yeah. And it's just weird that not weird, but it's it's not a it's not a coincidence that that standard is being set because it's all about competing. The cool thing is, is it's not just a coach competitive thing. Mm -hmm. Coach Rule, he always jokes about giving the example. Well, you tell those guys we got we got 15 third and shorts. It's like, oh, man, we got 15 more at the end. It's like, hey, the one are these 15. Yeah. Such and such. And then all of a sudden it's like they can go all day. 100%. So he he and he kept saying this. And I think we kind of low key rolled our eyes. Mm -hmm. Like oh yeah, competitive, competitive, competitive. But like the 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 three on the the three different teams, and coming up with that like that's creative, mm -hmm. because you felt like your team had a competitive spirit. So how can we build on that? Yeah, that's taking self inventory real time. Now how it manifests itself again in wins and losses, is is a is the seen. is the next phase. Yeah, to be determined. But being doing your homework in the meantime mm -hmm. is is progress uh it's so trickle down effect just a couple uh a couple of minutes left here but are there i know you really like riley van poppel you brought him up with shafe on tuesday is there any other guys in that defensive line room that you're looking at and you go hey i i think that guy might have a big year mm, i mean obviously nash i like van poppel i like you i like a lot of those guys you I, like nash at the lighter weight i do i i i like nash anyway Sure. Because I think he's going to finish more plays at 310 than he did at 335. I, I just like the like he lo he loves it. Mm -hmm. If you love something, that, it's like that matters. Oh, it's like anything else. Mm -hmm. If you truly love something and it's without it's like the agape, like unconditional. Mm -hmm. You'll do anything. Yeah. 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 He'll do anything. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think when that's the standard, when he could chill and he's not. Mm hmm. You know, you see a guy like Ty Robinson come back and he didn't have to. Mm -hmm. What's the next step for like a Cam Lenhart, Prince Will? So what Prince, does that look like? So it's kind of the same, I think, or different for the same reasons. I think for, for Cam, mm -hmm. it's maybe you play inside a little bit more. Okay. Maybe, you know, you, you develop a capacity to play against the run. So more you of can a three down you, type. In, in a three technique ish kind of spot, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, it's dark in there. It's a little loud. It's noisy. Learn to function in there with Prince Will, uh, Umami Wellen. It's just the opposite, mm -hmm. right? We know the length, gifted physically. You, we'll, we'll keep saying, I feel like it's the Stephen Bardo. Uh, who was the guy that he would always talk about? He'd say, I wonder if he knows how good he could be. Was mm. it, was it, Siobhan Shields? It was somebody. No, it was Blanton. Oh, Delano yeah, Banton. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, Banton. Banton, yeah. I wonder if he knows how good he could be. And I'm like, he need to say it every broadcast. Mm -hmm. With with Prince Will, you you hope that he understands how good he can be. How good he can be because physically he's yeah, he's got long arms, he's relatively lean for that we weight. Saw him make some freaky plays last year. Yeah, be be good against the run. Yeah. If if I'm if I'm you know, those are those are the steps for those guys. Kai Wallen, it's hey, hang in there against the intensity, multiple plays in a row. Mm -hmm. Go from flashy to consistent. Yeah. So I think they'll they'll have some uh Isaiah Roby, thank you, the mayor. Oh Roby. It right. was Roby. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's right, it was. Yeah. I know it was, I knew it was one of those light skinned guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um that's kind of how I feel about Prince Will. Because, you know, he says about, I don't know, probably 12 words a day maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot in there. There is a lot in there. Uh, good discussion there on the defensive line. There you go, TK. We got to it. Uh, we will have more. Hey, that's TK, it. I got to get on the comments. He man. was, Where you know, at? he was getting after us yesterday about the D-line. We got to the D-line, TK. We'll keep doing these positional group breakdowns throughout the spring. I'm going to try and do them every day. But like I said, this show's a wild card. I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, I put together a lineup, but that really means nothing. Oh. Um, we will be back with more Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. We're halfway through the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. We're here uh, at Herd at Sports Bar and Grill on the Pillar Exterior stage. And Cam Camden, Wetucky. Camden? Wetucky. Uh, from, we actually from Mich Michigan. Ooh. 
Ooh, I think, Grand, I think Grand Blanc. Grand Blanc? Not Grand Rapids? I think it's Grand Blanc. Because I know he went to GBC. I think he went to the community college, but yeah, he's uh he's up as a snapper. Pretty integral part. Oh yeah. Needed. Well, and and Sip's just out here trying to ruin everything by jinxing people. So why would he? What do you do? Sip, we need to do a little better than that. Uh, hey, so so Sip is Monday, Shane. He he will be on Monday he, with he, us. He, he. Slow down. <laughs> Sorry. Why you gotta say that? And that's gonna be a thing, isn't it? <laughs> Probably. Um, but no, magic. it's uh, we'll talk to Sip on on Monday. See why he's trying to jinx everything. See he was trying to ruin everything. You know. Yeah. yeah. That if they if they can elevate just the consistency. I don't even know what the the numeric benchmark is, but just the consistency of special teams. It's got to be worth plus one and a half wins. Well, and it's you got to get better from field goal place kicking outside of forty. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to return the ball better. That's been a problem for a while. And like that, that's, that's kind of, that's the thing right there. Well, cause the, I mean, and you're not even asking necessarily for, you know, splash plays or touchdowns or whatever out of the return game, but you're asking not to give up these huge chunks of hidden yardage, right? Yeah. It can't be, you can't go minus you know, 60 yards every game. Yeah, you can't be, you know, starting at the 15 when you could be starting at the 30. Like, that that's a thing that ha- has happened consistently over the last handful of years that probably does cost them games. And obviously the field goal kicking is easy to see, right, because it's it's the most tangible in terms of points on the board. But the the hidden yardage on on kick and punt returns is – maybe more concerning just because it's been such a consistent problem over the last few years. Um, But I don't know. We'll see. I, I think they've got the right mindset for special teams now. And I think that's half the battle. You're starting to get better depth too. So that's always. Yeah. Putting better players out there certainly always helps. (laughs) I'm telling you. (laughs) Uh, What's wrong with them schematically? I know I just don't have very good players out there. I don't, know if, it's te- I don't know if it's te- if it's technical or tactical, but let's start with let's some start with depth. Good, let's start with good players. Yeah, let's start with good players and go from there. Uh, speaking of good players, there's been a, a Major League Baseball story I kind of wanted to get to over the last few days uh, because the Major League Baseball Players Association uh, a couple days ago uh, came out with an I guess an accusation or a statement to the league, basically accusing the pitch clock of being the cause of all of these rash of arm injuries that we've seen from pitchers. And there has been a ton of discussion on both sides of the issue since then. And I know you're a big baseball guy, obviously. I grew up, you know, not very well, but pitching and doing, you know, playing baseball and whatever. And I just, when I hear that, it sounds like them just making excuses because they don't like the pitch clock. Like, I, I don't, it's not like injuries with pitchers are new. It's been getting progressively worse for probably two or three decades at this point, mm. where it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. The pitch clock has been around for one year at the major league level. It's been around for several years at the minor league level. But the trend hasn't, as far as I can tell in the data I've looked at, the trend hasn't changed with the pitch clock. It's changed with, um, and this is, probably the biggest argument against it it's changed with the analytics on spin rate that's the thing that is that and the balls i'm in agreement there there's there's, yep because i think there's multiple factors yeah because the spin is just my opinion yeah yeah i think the spin rate thing was birthed Mm -hmm. from obviously i think the astro staff were kind of the, the 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 kingpins of it or at least i think Tampa was early too yeah Tampa was early on that. And because you have to miss bats now. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and Verlander had a really, really good. Yeah, nobody pitches to contact anymore. Well, yeah, because you can't. Yeah. Now, maybe it'll be different without as much shifts mm-hmm. where a guy can push a ball weekly the other way and, and it'll work. But you know, it's like Verlander said, he's like, you know, you try to pitch guys low and away now or, or stay away. And he said, they just leave the yard. Mm-hmm. Opposite, oppo. Fi- opposite oppo field. On you, yeah. So he said the 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 real pressure now is is 
swing and miss. You 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 got to be a swing and miss guy. He said it's had to he's had to tr- may, change dramatically in terms of how he attacks hitters, and he's so late in his career. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a late career bump when he got to the dot or when he got to the Astros, which, which which really helped him with 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 swinging and missing. He said, but the other thing is is we're, he said, sure, a little bit of the pitch clock, sure, a little bit of the analytics. He said, but guys, now mm-hmm. they throw as hard as they can. It's the max effort thing, right? It's like the max effort every single pitch. You know, I'll take it. And, and and part of that's the depth of lineup. You, you can't take any breaks in a lineup anymore. Yeah, it's he said. So it's it's kind of like, in his opinion, a culmination of things. But but when guys put the ball in play, mm-hmm. they do uh, damage. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And he's. He's and he's been on record for years mm-hmm. about the noticeable change in the baseball. Yeah. And how guys train too. Yeah. No, he didn't make any accusations. But sure. He's like, guys can now leave the ballpark at any time, regardless of of of, of pitching placement. Yeah. So if you're not missing, if you're not putting if yeah, if guys aren't swinging and missing. Yeah. You you pay the price if you're not putting you know because we've seen it, it used to be when I was you know back in my day I've got to go old guy here but you go if if a guy threw 95 like that was heat mm-hmm. right now guys are throwing off speed stuff at 94 95 like that yeah you could easily see a 91 92 mile an hour slider yeah and I've seen a ton of 94 mile an hour Johnson Randy Johnson used to be unique yeah. <laughs> Right yeah. now, you see a 94, 95 mile an hour two seamer that has almost as much run as a slider. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I was just watching a uh, a Jordan Hicks video on uh, Pitching Ninja on on Twitter, and that thing was, bless Rob Friedman's heart. I I love that account. It's he, he's 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 fantastic. But I'm watching that thing come in in the mid 90s. Was that what, yesterday when you asked me how you're supposed to hit that? Oh, that was a different guy. It was that was some. I don't know who it was. It he ran it under up under his hands. Yeah, he was going righty into a lefty at one hundred and one on the inside corner, mm-hmm. and it's like even if you make contact with that, your bat saws in half, and you probably break your wrists, mm-hmm. right? Because it's coming in at one hundred and one on the black. You know how many guys used to be able to throw hundred miles an hour? Like maybe one or two yeah, at a time. Pretty rare. Now there's just dozens of them, right? Like there is. Like, you ha- you have you that's have, not a pitch clock. You have issue. stables of bullpens. That nobody throws lower than like ninety eight, right? And now, you, yeah, they they can't really get into the rotations because they don't have good command, mm-hmm. or they've only got two pitches instead of three or four. And conversely, like you used to be able to get away with command, and I think good pitchers will still tell you location matters, mm-hmm. but you can't. It's not as much about high, low, and in and out as and much as it's now. And as whatever. much as it is now, about you, you got to be able to make guys miss. Yeah, like I mean, it would be really hard to operate, and you wouldn't think you could hit Hater, right? Yeah, I mean Hater would run one up around your your numbers, and you shouldn't be able to catch up with that. Nope. But people are hitting that. Yeah, if it's straight, it doesn't matter how fast it is now. So, so I mean, it's like location still matters. I would just love to see. You, you know, guys that could paint black, and I mean, will you ever see Glavins again? Yeah, Glavin. I mean, I was Glavin Maddox. I mean, guys like that. Where I'd like to think Maddox because I, I say Glavin because it's more ascertainable. Yeah, Maddox was Glavin a freak. is. There's he's kind of the standard. Yeah, yeah. I just I think it's really disingenuous to be like, oh, it's the pitch clocks. No, I'm with you. It's, it's kind of it's kind of a lazy take. It's like, no, this trend has been happening for a while, yeah. and all the players have participated. Uh, coming up next, we will get to Brian Edwards, our Vegas insider here on Herd Sports Radio. We're wrapping up hour number two here on Herd Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube here on the Pillar Exterior stage. And joining us now is our guy, Brian Edwards. See if we can make a little money this weekend. B, what's going on, man? What's up, fellas? How we doing? Did you guys um, cash in on UConn Monday night? No, but didn't everybody? I feel like they did. I I don't think I know anybody who had Purdue. I I don't no. I don't understand. Like, is it just me or did Vegas have to take a bath? They had to. I mean, 
Oh, well, no, they could have changed the numbers. I can't even believe they threw out six there Saturday night. I, I, mean, like, I think the highest I saw was a seven. I just don't know, like, in, in good faith. I think I saw seven and a half at you one point. Couldn't even, you was... couldn't even convince yourself that seven was good value. And some people are value guys, right? Mm -hmm. And and I had a lot of futures tied up. So all I needed was the outright win. But And, and obviously, I could have gotten... You know, if UConn would have won by less than six, I'd have kicked myself. But I mean, I could not press. And I'm after the game, I'm like, man, that should have been the biggest bet of my life. I know <laughs> that's uh, everybody's. I'm serious. Like, I don't know. There had I, what was there like eighty percent of the public money on UConn, and that might be low. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, that's it had to be at least that. I mean, I mean what uh, like who do y'all think like I just go back to 90 91 UNLV and the Gators 06 07 in terms I mean obviously UCLA in the 70s well, that was way before me but like they had that dominant a run right right no well this one was more Donovan they won more than thir 13 or more in two uh, 12 games in, 13 in, or more yeah in terms of margin of victory nobody nobody's yeah like ever right, right ever right and so I don't know. I, I'm just watching that. And the crazy thing to me, and I don't like Dan Hurley as a just in general, but the coaching job he did, because I know I know you're a Gator guy, right? But they brought everybody back from 06 to 07. They brought everybody back, everybody that mattered, right? You're talking Horford, Brewer, Noah, Noah um, I'm missing one. Hum Humphrey and Torian Green. Green. That's the other one I was thinking of, right? So they brought everybody back. Or, uh, two different teams. Yeah, UConn lost their best three players, <laughs> yeah. and Hurley's like, "Nah, we we're cool. Don't worry about it." And yeah. they were better. Like that's yeah. the thing that is unbelievable to me. And you know, I do. I just have to remind everybody that Creighton beat that team by almost twenty. Kind of wax them a little bit in <laughs> Omaha here. But um, last team. I mean, you know, they were last team to beat the twenty eighteen Villanova it, team. He, he can't help himself. I'm just saying, you know, so Brian, like, it's, a, it's okay. Two of the most dominant teams that we've seen in the last uh, ten years: eighteen Villanova and twenty twenty four. Uh, UConn both lost their last game to Creighton. So I just, you know, whatever that's worth, yeah. just something to think about, something to take home. B, you got any futures on the Masters? Guys, y'all know I don't know anything about golf. <laughs> you know, give me something. I mean, I, I, I was no, going to. No, I, I just was. Sometimes, and I kind of know your personality a little bit. When you see all that plus money, like you'll ask a friend. Right, like, <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, like, like, hey, man, 40 to 1. Well, right. So, no, B, so we were talking earlier. Because Scotty Scheffler's wife is pregnant. He's the favorite at like plus 300, plus 325, whatever. The next closest guy is about plus 1,000. And I'm sitting here. First thing I think of isn't like, oh, what a good guy saying he's going to go be there for his wife. I was like, okay, if he bails in the middle of the tournament, like what does that do to the betting odds? Yeah, you think Vegas would go back and get a withdrawal? Or do you think they bake it into the odds up front? I, man, They're clearly not I, doing that. I, no, right. I didn't think so. Unless he'd be like plus 100 otherwise. You say he's a plus three hundred favorite? I mean, that's like yeah, you're plus, that's, that's that's Tiger. That's prime Tiger it Woods. Like plus that's what I, was, I think. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, I don't feel like I've seen a, that short of a number since Tiger in a, in his prime. Yeah, that's it's not even so. It goes three to one, and the next closest 10. is ten to one. Yeah, is that Rory? I'm sorry, guys. I'm in. Yeah, it is. Know. It is Rory. Yeah, there's a there's a jump. It, there's 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 probably there's a bunch of guys between like, Kepka, Rory. Those guys are like 10, Wyndham 11, Clark's and like 12, 12, 14, somewhere in there. Yeah, uh, but there's a bunch of guys between like 10 to one and 15 to one. But there's a huge gap between them and Scheffler. And I'm just he he said yesterday he would leave if his wife went into labor. And I'm just saying like, okay, is that a a hey Vegas calls no bet? Because they have, like, I really don't think they baked it into the odds. Otherwise, that would have he'd have to be closer to the pack. I this, think this guy's up four I, strokes on Sunday, and he gets the call, and he's like, "Yep, I'm out." I'll be like, "No, I'm gonna go ahead and finish my round, honey." <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm pretty sure the golf rules are if he starts the tournament, um, it's the bet bet is action. Right? right, that's right. that's that's what yeah. I, I. That's what I've always. Uh, and maybe heard. that's how they hedge those short odds too. Right, like okay, yeah, that's fine. You can take the prohibitive favorite, but he might bail. But on it, you. it could cost you. <laughs> uh, B, let's get into your wheelhouse here with UFC. Uh, got UFC. How three, about this card? How about this card though? Three hundred. Can, can we just say that? Like this card is unbelievable. It is so, so good. B, you gave us some some ones that you like right off the bat. Um, obviously, the headliner, uh, Oliveira and Hill. What do you like that one right off the top there? 
So, um, just really small. Oh, it's and Hill. Sorry, that's my. That, that's Carrera. all right. That's all right. Um, I'm gonna go with Hill. Now, this is a tough handicap. So he tore his Achilles at International Fight Week, which I didn't go back and look. It's usually that either the weekend before Fourth of July or the weekend after. So what? Early mid July, he tore his Achilles. So he, it feels like he's coming back a little bit early. Now, if so. If I thought he was really healthy, I would absolutely love Jamal Hill, and I think Jamal Hill would be favored. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, Pereira is great, um, and he can win, obviously. But uh, I like I like uh, Sweet Dreams Hill uh, at the small underdog price, like plus with one fifteen to bet MGM. But I I I have him in a, in a three leg parlay, which he would close. So if the parlay gets killed, I'll bet more on him. But just, you know, pre-show, mm -hmm. just a little bit on Hill, and I'll tell you about the parlay in a minute. All right. So I, the the names are star-studded, now, but where we're getting them in their career is interesting, and perhaps none more important than Oliveira, who at one time was like this feared monster. Mm -hmm. But he's been through so many wars. But can you turn down plus 180? Heck no, and it reminds me so much. Of, it reminds me so much of Dustin Poirier and uh, ben, Benoit Saint Denis. Uh, just at UFC 299, you got the veteran um, uh, going against the young up and comer. But how is the veteran this big of an underdog? Okay, so Oliver is 12 and one in his last 13. He'd won 11 in a row. He lost to Makachev for the to uh, lose the belt, but then he fights Darius, who's on an eight fight winning streak, and he finishes him in the first round. So he has a great bounce back performance. And Sarukian is a huge step up in competition. Now he faced Islam too in his USA. UFC debut and he lost. Um, then he ripped off a, a bunch of wins in a row. Um, he lost. Uh, he lost one fight and now he's won three in a row. But his best wins are Matt Frivola um, and uh, another guy who's not even ranked yet, who I'm, I'm spacing on right now. So huge step up in competition. I think Oliver still got it. He's is 34, but I got to take him plus uh, 190, 180, 190. B, I, I think the largest underdog play plus money play you have here is on Garbrandt, about two plus two fifty. I, I just I just watched him be on my TikTok get smoked by Kai uh, <laughs> after they had this heated, you know, sure. prelim. <laughs> yeah, Garbrandt yeah, yeah. went to sleep. I was like, why is he on my B page? And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I've been checking out UFC because. It's and it's just funny that that he's getting ready to roll now with his big mouth. So why do you like Garbrandt right. at plus money? So since he got starched by um, Kai Car France, um, he's won two in a row. It's been two and a half years since he got knocked out. It's now been more than five years since he had that three loss streak where he got knocked out three times, twice by Garbrandt. So he's in a much better place. He's matured. Um, and I, I think his head's right. Uh, it, he seems a lot happier. He had gone through a divorce. He, he had bad things going on in his life four or mm -hmm. five years ago. He's in a much better place. And he's always got a puncher's chance. So small play, but he's plus 250. Um, and this is this two former champions is the first fight of the entire card. That shows you how deep and awesome this card is. You want to talk Gaith G independently or as part of the three leg? Uh, either or, um, so I've got him in the three leg, uh, Gaethje against Holloway and, um, two, two formerly bad, bad men, which yes. version are we getting of both mm. these old veterans? Yeah, I think, uh, we're going to get a great version and this has uh fight of the night, if not fight of the year written all over it. Um, and the price is going down on Gaethje. Um, if it goes Less than minus 150, I might bet a little bit straight, not too much. But so I've got him in the parlay uh, with Whaley Zhang in the co main. She's the only like heavy favorite. And then Hill to close it out. So if, if Zhang and, and Gaethje both win, and I've already got a little bit of a bet on Hill, and it's a three to one, you know, pays three to one, I will definitely hedge a little with per Pereira um, if I'm, my parlay is still alive. But Gaethje Holloway, it's going to be awesome. Um, you know, we saw Holloway go up, uh, to 155 and fight Poirier once, and you could tell the weight was a factor. 
Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's the factor here. I think it'll be a great fight, but I, I give the edge to Gaethje. Hey, can you believe, um, and maybe this is more of out of respect to Nama Yunus, but that Zhang is like bounce back because 2021 seems like forever ago <laughs> when people look at the dominance of her career, but she lost to Rose back to back. And since then, like she got Joanna, uh, she got the decision over Amanda, but she's like a monster. And just three years ago, she couldn't beat Rose. It's, it's kind of weird. Right. Yeah. I was, and I was there when Rose knocked her out and that was shocking. I mean, yeah. It wasn't shocking that Rose won, but it was shocking the way it happened. <laughs> no, and, not, uh, not, not, now she's five to one to Saturday. Yeah, and I I just think that Wei Li is uh, wow, she is kind of getting up there at age thirty four, but I, I I think she's got this one. Um, it, you know, I lost on her inside the distance her last fight uh, when she did win by decision, so I'm hesitant to go that route again, um, which is the only way I could better straight because she's too heavily favored. But I got her in the parlay. That's Brian Edwards, BrianEdwardsSports.com, Vegas Insider. B, we appreciate it as always. Thanks, B. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great weekend. Kicking off hour number three here on Hard Ass Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula, and we're brought to you by the Omaha Supernovas. Go to Supernovas.com to check out schedule, where you can watch the away games, what you can find for a little bit of merchandise in their shop as well, or you can get tickets for their next home match coming up on April 20th right here at the CHI Health Center. That's April 20th here in Omaha. Go to supernovas.com for tickets, uh, any information you need, and like I said, get a little bit of merch as well to wear to those games. That's supernovas.com. Joining us now is our guy, Michael Brunts from Husker 24-7. Brunts, what's going on, buddy? Not much. How you guys doing? What's up, Mr. Mensa? How 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 are things? How's it how's it been? Not bad. Not bad. How you been, DB? It's been a while. I know. I'm I'm hanging in there. I am I'm curious because I feel like three out of the last six times I've talked to you, I said, Hey, what do you think Nebraska should do about Caleb Clark? But I'm gonna ask you a different one. <laughs> because and this isn't just recency bias, it's just because it, it, it hasn't been as smooth as sailing and where his importance is in this staff, whether it's midday or a spot start on the weekend. I'm curious. What do you think the direction is for Drew Christo? If, if you're Will Bolt. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> the, so it's, he's tricky. The answer, the, the answer to that, I think is also, Influenced quite a bit by what's around him. Okay. Right? Because I, I think, you know, Nebraska has the Saturday stuff figured out, I think, with McConaughey. He, he can at least get you – he can get you five or six, and that's more than enough on Saturday for this team at the bullpen, the high-leverage guys at least. Yep. Um, you know, with Christo, it's a matter, I think, of whether you feel like on Sundays he can get you enough depth in the start to, you know, on Sunday, sometimes you're bringing a guy back for the second time on the weekend. And you, you can't be, you know, running your bullpen guys in there in like the fourth inning. And, you know, I, I think for him, the problem is, is that there's such a high ceiling. And sometimes it's, it's just tough to get to that ceiling. I mean, I, his last couple of starts, he's, you know, falling behind a little bit or the fastball has been a little bit too over the plate. And, you know, I, he, he's got a good fastball, but everybody can hit velocity now. And you got to be just, able to We just talked it. about that. <laughs> like, you got to be able to locate it better. I, I was watching your Dodgers yesterday, Damon. Yeah. And Miller? I mean, but yeah. I mean, the 98 looks great, but it can go back the other way really fast. You if found that out in the first inning, huh? You didn't have to wait too long. <laughs> I'll say 98 and straight comes back at you at about 110. Yeah, and, and blame yeah. and ba- blame BC too because yesterday morning he goes yeah and uh, good luck on the sweep. My twins are having a hard time scoring. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well if you, Dodgers aren't going to score more than two, you're okay. Yeah. So I, I yeah that, that's kind of the 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 question I guess is whether or not you feel better with Cristo on Sundays or Walsh is your guy on Sundays and you know. It, I think it, you basically know who your four starters are now. 
um, more than likely. It's just a matter of kind of how you want to line up the the back two, which is Christo and Walsh. So, Brunts, if you're if you're kind of evaluating Nebraska here, and you know they still have a pretty strong RPI, they've got they'll have a couple opportunities in conference, whether it's Maryland or Ohio State or even Rutgers that are not, you know, they're, they're pretty solid in terms of opponents. F- folks in Columbus are saying, oh, it's not where we want to be, but it's about time we at least have a pulse. Yeah. yeah you they, know, they showed up on Sunday. It's amazing. How are they not better? <laughs> like, like, how have they not been better since Nebraska has been in the big 10? They, they've always had just kind of okay guys. I mean, they're always that team that if I, they always underperformed a little bit. They had guys that would show, that, that would kind of pop up in the majors here and there that, that you're kind of like, Oh, I, I remember him. He was, you know, you, we saw him for four years. He was um, fine. <laughs> yeah, he was okay. He was okay. Um, I don't know. It, it, I, I, it's a good question. I, I think the the hire they made was kind of intriguing because he, you know, they they, they brought guys from power baseball conferences and uh, they recruit well. Well, they're they're still pretty young, so we'll see if they can do anything there. But that 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 it has always seemed like a school that should probably be a little bit better than what they are, a little bit more consistent at least. That it, it felt like they were a little volatile with where they would finish in the in the Big Ten standings. So, so Bruns, let me ask you this. you got a few yeah. opponents in the top 50. You've got over half the league in the top 100 currently. So you've got some opportunities for quality wins or at least not disastrous losses, right, which I think in the Big Ten is, is just as important. Is, it, is Nebraska's margin of error a little bit bigger this year than maybe we anticipated or it has been in years past in terms of you don't have to – really wring your hands quite as much about every game you lose within Big Ten play? Uh, yes. There's still an element, though, of, like, there's certain games that you just can't – like, they needed to – even Northwestern, when they played them, that was a they, – they were 72 in the RPI, mm-hmm. which – And they're, like, 105 I mean, now, I think. Yeah, I mean, they, they're kind of trending the way that you kind of thought they would. But, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the tough part for Nebraska is just by virtue of playing baseball – the, the RPI and the strength of schedule is going to struggle from what it was. Sure. And I think people just need to kind of be okay with that. Um, that said, I mean, the next, what, 10 to 12 games you've got, let's see, you're, you're going to Rutgers, which I think is that's a better top, than that's what a they've top shown. 50. You've got K-State in a midweek. You've got Kansas in a midweek. You've got Creighton in a midweek. And you've got Maryland and Iowa. Um so th- I mean, this this is kind of you, you don't want to say, oh, this this is the season right here, but I mean, it's this is a really key stretch of games for this team in terms of where they're going to head um, and, and what the postseason looks like for them. So um, they, they've got to they they got to get things kind of dialed in here um, to, to finish up April because a lot of the not marquee, but the the games that you would hope that you would win as a potential NCAA tournament team are, are they're right here. So. Um, get, you got to get it in order. Maybe it's as easy as saying play them both. I don't, after having watched this team so much and knowing both guys, but Nebraska offensively has shown a lot of versatility. What do you think they ultimately land on in terms of how to play Sanderson and Brumball and play to both their strengths at the same time? Yeah, offensively. well, yeah. That, I mean, the I, I, I asked Will this specifically yesterday if he's been kind of frustrated by the fact that they haven't gotten Sanderson in the lineup more but I mean he had that bat against Kansas the other night that it it was like a seven or eight pitch at bat oh I know yep yep and and it was just like that's like a 22 year old 23 year old type at bat not like an 18 year old kid and that that's how he's been since he showed up on campus and you know, I, I think one thing that's going to help them, um, you know, Will didn't commit to this yesterday, but I think it's trending that way, is that there's potential that they could get Brumbaugh back in the field in some form or fashion, whether that's in the outfield or at second base. Mm. And if you do that, then you all of a sudden free up the designated hitter spot mm. and you have some place that you can put Sanderson. I mean, they, they've they been willing to put him in in the outfield the last few games he played some first base against kansas when stone left the game so there's options there but i mean the easiest way is just for brumbaugh to get 
healthy enough to play in the field. And then you put both of them in there, which, I mean, Brumbaugh's been a really nice spark when he's been in there at the top of the lineup. And, I mean, they, they've hit Sanderson leadoff. They've hit him, I think, third and fourth in the lineup. He can kind of do everything. So getting him in the in in the, the lineup every day would be huge, especially as they've kind of, you know, had some consistency issues with, with Anglum and, and Swanson and some of those guys that are, you know, kind of in a platoon right now in the outfield. We're talking with Michael Brunts, Husker 24-7. Uh, Brunts, let's change gears here, go to football now. Um, obviously, media got a little bit of an extended time viewing practice uh, and maybe not extended time so much as a different look rather than a lot of stretching. You actually got to see a little bit of, you know, football, which is nice. Um, and did you walk away with it, uh, walk away from it with any uh, dramatic le- declarations you'd like to declare on incredibly small sample sizes? Uh, not, not the one that you're talking about. I don't think I want to <laughs> declare anything there. Um, who says I'm trying to lead you anywhere, Brunson? I'm just I'm just asking a question. You were you were leading me there. You pulled the chair out for me. He did. Um, that's, that's what he does. Careful. I mean, it, the the throws were nice. I mean, that that was my takeaway. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that was you know out of the ordinary for anything that you know anybody that's seen him, seen Danny Kalen play has, has seen him do. Um, you know, you, you, you win, you, you don't win the elite 11 accuracy competition by accident. So um, that, that, that didn't really shock me all that much. Um, I, I, you know, having seen this team, I guess, in, in various forms, you know, from very small windows in the last two weeks, the, the thing that's, that I'm struck by, and I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I mean, just when you compare where the offensive line is right now from where they were this time last year, um, maybe not in, in the way that they perform, but just the, the number of guys that they have that you can kind of talk <laughs> yourself into getting on the field. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I it, mean, uh, I the, completely the, agree. Robbie dribbled this yeah, a couple weeks ago. He goes, how weird is it that we haven't even talked about Mike Mazuka And a year ago, that would have been a guy that you felt like had to play if he transferred in. Yeah, and it's it, the the thing that was interesting to me about the the open the, the the actual eleven on eleven football that we got to see was how different the combinations were that I probably would have expected to be in there, like the 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 whatever the the first team that they were using. I mean, you had two, you had a redshirt freshman at left tackle, you had. Um, Jacob Hood at right tackle and uh, the interior guys, it was Micah Mazuka and Henry Lutovsky with Justin Evans at center. And it looked okay. Like the picture looked okay there. And then you, you, ro- you roll in and, and you've got Teddy at left tackle. Um, I'm trying to remember who the guards were with that group, but um, you know, Ben Scott's playing center. You've got Bryce Benhart who's played, I, I think about 75 games as a Nebraska football player at right tackle. Um, I mean, the, the conversation this time last year was, do we have enough offensive linemen to complete the spring game? Mm-hmm. And now you're rolling in, you know, a, a pretty good two deep of, um, offensive linemen. And, and, you know, by the way, you've got Grant Bricks over there. You've got um, Gibson Pyle, two two freshmen that are on campus that look the part right now, too, to my eye. Um, you know, Sam Sledge is in there, too. I was saying all the yeah. guys that redshirted so, last year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, that that was kind of what stood out to me the most, was just like, man, they've, they've really overhauled what they've got going on there. And you're right about Mazuka. I mean, he looks like a guy that's that started at multiple Power 5 places. Like, I, that. that's a... There wasn't much fanfare to that addition, but if, if that can hit, I mean, that that's huge for that offensive line. How about them getting Jacob Hood back where he's functional and able to move around <clears throat> well? Like, yeah, they're and I get it. Coach Rules talks about it, but we don't really know because we we can't see the practical application of it. But the rest recovery rehab portion of of his philosophy and getting guys ready to play mm-hmm. is is so refreshing because. He can buoy that Bruncey against, and we don't think, oh, they're just being lazy, or if a guy loafs or slacks in practice, they're forced to play him anyway because 
they don't have anybody else, right? There's no, I shouldn't even use his name, but it's not like, you know, they got these guys at the in the wide receiver room that have been at odds with coaches that they have to play because they're the best players, right? It's like right. he can say they need rest and recovery and, and rehab is important, but you know they're going to get their work in too. Right. No, and, and I mean, Hood's an interesting case because I, you know, from talking to people that covered Georgia, I don't know that there was a lot of um, expectation that he would, you know, be where he is right now at Nebraska. Um, that that's probably the gentle way of putting it. Yeah. And I, you know, he, he looks a lot different. Um, he'd obviously had a lot of, you know, injury issues at, at Georgia and early on at Nebraska. And I mean, just, just him being out there the other day with that, with the group he was out there with, I was kind of like, Oh, that's, that, that was a surprise to me. Uh, we're talking with Michael Bruns, Husker 24 uh, seven Bruns earlier. We were talking on the other side of the line, the defensive line and kind of going mm-hmm. through some breakdown on that as well. Um, kind of, kind of a similar vibe from last year to this year on that one as well. I think maybe we had a little more confidence in the defensive line, but I think we looked at it and be like, oh man, we're going to need X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that was player. everybody's concern except for yours. Yeah, I, I liked them coming out of the spring, and I don't know why. I, I probably just kind of a blind squirrel in a nut situation there. But, you know, this is a, a defensive line that maybe second to the offensive line has had the biggest perception change year over year because of what mm-hmm. we saw last year, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, and for different reasons, yeah. right? I'm not, I'm still not sure we love Donnie. But boy, do we love Knighton, and they're both come heck or high water, and they've both been pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have been, and and it's the the defensive line conversation. I mean, people have to remember this time last year. I mean, Nash Hutmaker was not Nash Hutmaker. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh there yeah. Was, a lot of the conversation was, you know, is, is he ready to, to take that step? Like, is it, can he have that? Can we of, get thirty plays? <laughs> yeah. remember, remember that. Yeah, I, I probably said something stupid. Me like too. That. Hey, I did. Uh, Welcome to the like Air Dap Club. Everybody was, everybody was hoping that he could just be, he could just be like senior year Damian Daniels. Probably yeah. was what everybody was hoping for. And you know, I, his emergence has completely changed that room. Um, and then you know, guys that Rock- guys that we thought had to be good, like Elijah Judy, were kind of afterthoughts. Mm-hmm. How about yeah? How about Shafe looking like a genius? Remember how much and you know because you talk to him more, but how he was banging the drum over Riley Van Poppel in that recruitment, and how he yeah. felt like for so long, like Nebraska fans didn't recognize what they potentially could be getting. Well, and it was uh, I'm trying to remember the timeline of everything, but he was one of those guys that had committed early. Mm-hmm. And kind of got lost in the walk. Yep. You know what I mean? One hundred percent. And I remember Schaefer and I did a, a we did like a 20 minute interview podcast video thing with Van Poppel. And you're kind of like, okay, this, this guy, this guy gets it. Like, and that, that I feel like is always such an indicator of what, how much early success a guy has is like, whether or not just like the, he's like, framing things right in his mind about going to college and like what the challenge is. And he just had that. And I mean, he, he got valuable, valuable snaps last year. I think he's going to get a ton out of that year. And, you know, the conversation now with that defensive line in my mind is, you know, you've got a lot of guys that are kind of not a lot, but a few guys that are more like situational pieces. Mm. And if, if you can get like James Williams, Elijah Judy, and, well, I mean, Van Poppel to a degree. I mean, if you can get them to be three down players, I mean, that that's that's a really scary group that they've got um, that, that, that they can kind of use to attack you in different ways. And I'm intrigued by what Ty Robinson can be after. I, I don't know what you guys, it felt like at the end of the year with him, he was so close to making so many like oh. really big plays. And you, you just wonder if, if, you know, with another year, um, and, and, you know, of experience and whatever he's going to do in the off season, if, if that, if those, those kind of almost become plays that he makes, you, you know, Bruns, I asked somebody about this. Uh, it was probably one of your Husker 24 seven colleagues, either BC or shape. I don't remember. We talked to so many of you guys, uh, mm-hmm. but the big three, man, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching those, 
those, you know, chasing three little documentary videos and stuff. And I'm looking at Nash and Ty and, you know, I agree with you. I think Ty was really close to making a bunch of finishing a bunch more big plays last year. I think Nash was the same way. We know the weight loss story with Nash and the wrestling and everything. And he's going to play lighter this year. But I also saw in that episode, Ty Robinson, who looked like maybe one of the leanest 300 pounders I've ever seen in my life walking around in street clothes. I don't know if that's going to translate, but it does have me a little excited. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and that's, you saw a lot of guys kind of transform themselves last off season, but you know, this is year two with the strength staff and the way that they approach things. And I, there's a few of those guys that are walking around that look completely different. I mean, Teddy, Teddy looks like he was kind of on the Bryce Benhart trend. Oh gosh. Last I, year. I was messing with him the other day and he kind of only barely chuckled. So I didn't know if I was funny or not, but <laughs> man, you gave it a courtesy laugh. Yeah. That's kind of how it felt. <laughs> But then he like picks me up off the ground for a hug. I had to get on my tiptoes again. But he is smiling and moving and jogging and running. Like it, it's like, oh my gosh, I think I have a warm spot. Right. <laughs> it's like just to see him because it's hard, man. You look at him and you're like, that's a lot of humanity. Yeah, he's for guys to be moving around and we just take and for to granted. Be athletic at that size. Yeah. But he yeah. his frame of mind, he seemed to be in a good spot. Yeah. No. Well, do you think it's just him being on the field? Like maybe. I'm yeah, just to, not being injured. Like I mean, it's it's been a long road for him, and and the spring is kind of you know historically for him been a time where it's like he's dealing with something. Um, but yeah, no, I I we we talked to him. I think one of the first times out um, in spring, and and you could tell there was a lightness about him. And I he's always a guy too that you know when when he talks. Like he, he takes this very seriously, mm. like the football thing. And, you know, I think he thinks pretty seriously about confidence and stuff like that. And he doesn't really hide it. So, I mean, the, the fact that he's, you know, manhandling you and smiling and stuff like that, I guess that's a, that's a good sign for where his head's at maybe. Uh, I got to go back to baseball before I get you out of here, Brunson, <laughs> Brunson, just because I'm, I, I get varying opinions and we've watched this thing up close. Number one, do you even have a comp for the turnaround? And number two, what in the world do you think has happened with Sears year over year? Um, there's we, we were talking about this in the press box on Friday, of whether or not there's somebody that's had that kind of a turnaround. And I, I couldn't think of anybody right offhand. Um, you know, but you, you look at the numbers that he had in the summer. He's just always been a guy that if you um, if he's starting, it just it just clicks with him more. And I mean, you know, Will and, and the staff, I think, has kind of had to wear it a little bit and to their credit. They have that, you know, they, they kind of missed the mark with trying to bring him out of the bullpen as a high leverage guy last year. I mean, mm. that, that's just the, the truth of it. And I don't know. I mean, he, he's got great control. The fastball, he, he can, you know, really locate it well. Against Ohio State, I mean, I want to say he threw in the last three or four innings. I was sitting next to the Ohio State guys that were tracking it up in the press box, and he threw something like 30 or 40% of, of his pitches were change-ups. Mm -hmm. And to the point where it was like they were wondering if he had developed a new pitch based <laughs> on what he was showing. So, I mean, he legitimately has four pitches that he can throw for strikes. I think he has a really good understanding of how to, to pitch, not just how to throw. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the other thing that he does that I know just annoys the heck out of hitters, he works really fast. It's unbelievable. Like, it, it's it's almost it, like, I are you at wake or like he works quick? Yeah. Like they like the umpires have had to tell him a few times to calm it down and slow down. Um, so <laughs> he, he, he's, he's in a he's he's on a really kind of a putting together a special year so it, he'll be fun to watch over the second half of the year here it's michael brunts husker 24 7 bruncey we'll talk to you again soon thanks you guys take care thanks bruncey that's michael brunts husker 24 7 we will have more of heard at sports radio on am 590 espn omaha espn tri-cities and kfor in lincoln coming up next
Welcome back here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on KFOR in Lincoln as well as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And we're brought to you by our friends at War Horse Casino, War Horse Sportsbook. That is the best place in Nebraska to place your sports bets. You've got the casino in Lincoln. You've got Horseman's Park in Omaha. You don't even have to, you know, go to another state or cross a river or anything like that. Right here in town, no matter if you're in Omaha or Lincoln, you can place your bets at War Horse Sportsbook. You know, maybe you didn't get your master's bets in early for the futures. Maybe you want to see what the live lines are now that we know Scotty Scheffler might be bailing to go have a baby at any point. Who knows? Or maybe you want to hit up some UFC 300 like we just talked to our guy B. Edwards about. You can bet on nearly every major sporting event at War Horse Sportsbook. Go to warhorsecasino.com slash sportsbook for a full list of house rules and details. That's War Horse Sportsbook. No bets, no glory. Uh, D.B. What up? Oh, nothing. Just doing a little radio show here. How, how are things? You know, I'm doing all right. By the way, by the way, real quick, it seems like that has happened Br- before. Brunt's is hilarious, by the way. What do you do? Oh, we're just, he kind of went in depth about the the Ohio State guys tracking Oh yeah, Sears. I would have probably laughed, and some of it is Brunson's delivery. But yeah, I'm sure he's like retelling exactly how it happened. Yeah, and I'm just I'm laughing to myself. It's amusing for you. Yeah, I plus I think he's funny. What's, What's up, Shane? What's up, Shane? I was just gonna say it seems like that has happened before. Where a, uh, I I want to say it happened during the, one of the Super Bowls where somebody was their wife was getting ready to have a baby and they decided to be in the Super Bowl instead. I, I, it seems like this it's is, not uncommon. It's not no, uncommon. There was a there was a Rams receiver mm-hmm. Van or Vaughn or yeah. uh, I, I think uh, number twelve Jefferson Jefferson yeah yeah um, he found out right after a game like the reporter told him he was having a baby so he peaced out. Yeah. Uh, RG three, I think, from the was a national that's championship a fa- game. That's a famous that's, one where he goes okay. sprinting off. That's yeah. that's probably what I was thinking. He goes, "I'm having a baby." And that's just, a yeah, famous one. runs. Um, yeah. So I mean, but we've also seen where guys are like, "Ah, yeah, she's having a baby. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit it up after mm-hmm. the game. Like we're gonna." Yeah, yeah to say thing. that you're you're ahead of time. Yeah, I'll be out. I'm just saying that that's easy to say on a Wednesday. Yeah, on the weekend with a lead, that's a lot harder to when say. you're like, wait. What's that jacket size again? Oh, Ooh, I'm a I'm a 44 God. long. Yeah, Is that, that thing's already waiting for me? Ooh, I remember the last one fit pretty nice. How I many don't... of these guys have multiple? What do I Not have a lot. crack at? Not a lot. That's yeah. what I'm like. I mean, listen, I'm gonna say <laughs> something here. Well, we know you don't like kids. It doesn't count. It's and you only you only, and how 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 long is the window gonna be open for you to get one of these? True. I'm gonna <laughs> say this. It's harder to win a masters than it is to have a baby. Oh no. A lot of people without any talent in the world have a baby. Oh no. A lot of lot of lot of dumb, unskilled people have babies. No disrespect to any couples that are struggling to have kids. I apologize on Robbie's behalf. Listen, I, I understand there is a struggle sometimes, and it's really unfortunate for those people, and I feel for them. So a green jacket wouldn't be a tough hang for you. You know, I don't know if green's my color, but I'm, I'm much more likely to put on a green jacket than I am to uh, have a child. Poor Meredith. They've only been married for, this is like four years. It's fine. Is this their first, <laughs> is this their first kid? I, I don't want to speculate, but I assume so. Well, it, it, that's the only way this even makes a little sense if it's the first one. What if he just wants to be with his wife? Listen, she knows what job he has. <laughs> wow. Right? <laughs> Like no, I'm the, the guy without the family is the family spokesman. I've got a family, Scotty. No, no, no. I've got yeah, a family. Right. I just don't have children. There's there, a difference. There we go. Okay. Okay. So here's the thing, though, is <laughs> my wife knows my wife what I do. She for, knows what I do for a living, right? Yes. So she knows Saturdays in the fall not really an option for anything. <laughs> don't really have a lot of leeway there. <laughs> Because that's a critical part of the job function. Uh-huh. You know what's a critical part of a job for a golfer? Going to going to play in the mas- in the Masters, do you right? Think, going to play in the majors. Do you think they would let him zoom it if that was happening, like when he was playing? No, you can't have your phone. Yeah, but I mean, special circumstance like this? Well, I mean, they did have a special circumstance to let Tiger on the golf course before any black people were allowed there. So <laughs> it's not 
the first time they would make an exception for does his it, offer. Does it seem like he has more than one major? I would have thought so. Yeah, because he's a he's playing really really well right now, and B he's kind of been in these favorite spots in terms of betting mm -hmm. odds. It seems like a lot in the last two years. Do you know when he turned pro? Twenty twenty two. Eighteen. Really? Mm -hmm. He didn't start winning until twenty twenty two. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Wonder what happened in those four years. <laughs> I'm just curious. Like, he must have got a lot better. Well, golf is hard. Golf is hard. Go golf is hard. He, he got a couple but, corn uh, fairy wins in there. But I think he, he finished, I don't know, he finished, he was in the top 10 and 21 in the open. I think he, he it was tied for something, maybe seventh or eighth. Yeah. Um. So he was, it was two and a half short years before he experienced his first top 10 finish on the tour. I'm just saying seven billion people in the world have been either the result of or actively involved in a birth. <laughs> How many majors winners do we have? How many masters winners do we have? Are you just playing the numbers game? Yeah, I mean, it's harder. It's harder to do. I don't know Miss Scooter or Scudder, however you pronounce it. I'm sure she's Scheffler now. At least she didn't have to change her initials. That's a bonus. That helps. That helps. I'm uh, just, you know, it's a lot harder to win a masters. Than I, I'm, have a I'm, up, I'm up four strokes. It's 130, and you're getting ready to hear those, this, you know, the, the beautiful voice come on. The Jim Nance. Yeah, tradition like no other <laughs> Sunday in Augusta. On and a, he's like, on Amen Corner. And you're like, hey, man, there's a golf cart without a governor that's going about 46 mile an hour up to the clubhouse. Oh, look, that's Scotty Scheffler with a four hole lead. He's out. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's really easy to say on a Wednesday. Hey, how would you feel? It's really easy to say on a Wednesday. If you're like, you know, Wyndham Clark or or Joaquin Neiman or somebody, and you're four strokes down through eight and on all, Sunday, and, and he bounces, and you're the winner. You know how you, I would you're going to wear that thing proudly? 100%. Oh, God. You know why? Because I was dedicated to the game, and he wasn't. There we go. Because I was all in, and he wasn't. <laughs> hey, what's that thing we keep saying, right? Hey, half of it's just showing up. So you just got to keep you showing just up. rock the jacket. One thousand oh, percent. Without a doubt. I, I don't, don't care know. if I'm getting in on a technicality. Would you, would you, I don't care at all. Would you name your jacket, Scotty? <laughs> I would name it after whatever he names his kid that he thought was more important than the masters. Wow. Listen, <laughs> I'm just saying if I'm Wyndham Clark. I'm wearing that thing loud and proud because guess what? In five years, nobody's going to remember the circumstances. Not a soul. Yeah, they will. No, they won't. No, they won't. Nobody's, listen, nobody except for me remembers that Steph Curry's first title at Golden State happened with Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving both out against Cleveland. Guess what? Nobody cares anymore. I guarantee you sometime cares. on Sunday morning for like the next 35 years, that'll be like a 10 or 15 minute segment before the Masters finals. That'll be Scotty Scheffler. 100% not. Hole 16 in the golf cart without the governor racing up a to. Max, it gets remembered for 10 years. Tops. Five years from now, nobody's talking about this. Nobody cares. They're like, oh, Wyndham Clark, Masters champion. I don't know, but do you know what I did last night what? until roughly two in the morning? I watched like. Players Championship where Hal Sutton held off Tiger. I watched his final round over Bob May in the playoffs. Like, I went back and – yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, so I'm holding I, – okay. I don't know if that's true yet. I'm, I'm waiting. To so when, when, when he does that, are they just and – if, and if he's already hit the ball, will they just leave it there? I mean, do they – out of respect, will his ball just stay there on the course until he comes back to finish up the round? I don't know. I – uh what I do know is this. If I'm the guy who wins because Scotty Scheffler couldn't keep his eye on the prize, I'm wearing that jacket with pride. Guess what? My name goes up on that wall just like everybody else's does. The other thing, if I'm Scotty Scheffler and my wife is insisting that I'm present for the birth of a child and I lose several million dollars and the an opportunity for my second major might be a little resentment there long term mm. i'd have a hard time like that's almost a no-win situation for both of them can right? he can he zoom it on like a watch or something like that like the apple watch i mean since you can't have your phone i don't think you can have any of that stuff shane i still what about the glass you would like gladly get fitted for the coat oh without a doubt hey what do we keep saying 
just keep showing up. Scotty Scheffler doesn't show up. I'm going to show up. If I'm Wyndham Clark or if I'm Matsuyama or whoever you like. We have to check the accuracy of a tweet that just came out. Yeah. We could, we could potentially we have, might have a little breaking, breaking news, here. news. Give me a couple uh, seconds here while we uh, while we pay the bills. We're going to check on something here. We might have some breaking news on her at Sports Radio. That's did, uh, did she have the baby already? I'm Ravi Lula. If she did. That, that, that ain't it. That'd be <laughs> hilarious, though. Easier to leave now than with a lead on Sunday. Wow. Uh, we'll be back with more Herd at Sports Radio. Wrapping up the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube here at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill from the Pillar Exterior Stage. Uh, so we were able hello, to con- hello pillar. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. What's up? Uh, we were able to confirm the breaking news we hinted at before the last break, and that is that one OJ Simpson has passed away. Um, as of yesterday, it looks like his family put out a tweet from his account um, that he uh, succumbed to his cancer that he had been fighting, which I I didn't realize he had. Um, apparently on a Google search, there was a couple reports about it, but a pros- prostate cancer a couple months ago. Yep. But man, he must have really let that. He, if, uh, they must have found that really late, late in the game. Yeah. yeah. Cause now thankfully prostate cancer has become pretty treatable. Mm-hmm. It used to be a huge issue and, and one of the number one, um, causes of death for, for men in that age group. Um, luckily that that's usually no longer the case, but, um, if he wasn't able to, um, if he wasn't able to get uh, on top of it in time, obviously, uh, it can still be very, very serious. And um, I don't know if it was that, if it spread, uh, whatever. Obviously, we don't know the details there. But uh, O.J. Simpson is uh, is dead as of yesterday, according to his own Twitter account, uh, a message from his family. So um, I know that's he's a. I mean, he's a very strange figure in our history as a country, um, just because of all the different stories that go along with him like he's a really weird like there are certain people when they pass that they're very difficult to eulogize yeah to to kind of put a bow on their life right because that's what we kind of tend to do here is like well oh. especially as men right like yeah t- not just that we have he's polarizing because of the alleged chart the the you know yeah the alleged charges and him being in prison but men typically don't get their flowers while, while they're, they're alive, alive anyway. Yeah. And right. And, and yeah. people will spend their nine minutes saying something good about you when they could have checked on you. Anytime. Over Any, the anytime last... over however long you were alive. But yes. I mean, that's just typically what we do. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, obviously um, a, a whole other issue in its own right. But it. Uh, yeah. So that's that's all I really have to say about that. I don't I don't really. Ooh, you force Robbie Gump. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> um <laughs> By Jen A. Used to be. I ran to get where I was going. Never thought it'd take me anywhere. <laughs> wow. I actually really like Forrest Gump. Um, that ain't wet. It is maybe the most unintentionally funny movie of all time. Can you do the dorm room scene again? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know Shane could do that. I'm sorry. Mom, get my nuts. Get my nuts. So for me personally, I wouldn't leave the Masters if I was uh, having a kid. Um, I'm too exhausted from being uh, amazing yesterday. No, so I do need to. So, okay. So I'm <laughs> going to change gears here. OJ Simpson's dead. That's the news we had to break. Um, I'm going to ignore everything happening on that side of the table for now. I so like turtles. I made a joke about Tiger Woods and, and Augusta National being a little bit racist or whatever. Um, and of course, you know, cause Twitter is what Twitter does. Say, did Hootie, did Hootie call Ravi? Yeah, our dark forces. <laughs> that was Gandalf, I think. Um, the, it, I thought it was really, Morgan, you go, you go, I thought it was Morgan Freeman and I almost said Ned, but that would be unforgiven. <laughs> and no, I was just like, I'm almost, I'm almost positive. That was Gandalf. What, what? Did you hit me with that? Cause I'm talking about Tiger Woods. You go dark forces. Really? Shane. <laughs> that was happening. Oh, don't get me started on that this morning. Is that what's happening right now? I say we're we're talking about black people playing at the Masters, and you're like, "There's dark forces on the moon." Now that's a little bit of a mental gymnastics way to weave that in. Closet, um, <laughs> closet. What? You seem very hurt right now. You.
Wow. Closet nerd because I like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Love Lord of the Rings. That's not closet. I'm a huge dork. Um, no. Do you smell? So I'm I'm making jokes about how Augusta National is a little bit racist. And then, of course, the, the well actually crowd <laughs> chimes in. Well, Calvin Pete played eight times in the 80s and. It now, was, how do you know that's their voice? Well, and because every per, every well, actually I de- comes, I defended. I said I thought you were being sarcastic. I wa- I was making it. Listen, if you come to this program <laughs> for your informative purposes, you got a problem. This uh, is I'm mostly here just to make jokes. <laughs> DB might inform you occasionally. <laughs> wow, backhanded. <laughs> I, I, so right now, this last three minutes, I feel there's a lot going on here with some backhanded innuendos. Who, me? No, the I'm other the, guy. I've got the dark forces at work over here, guy. Man, I feel great, man. I know I'm going to one Disneyland. Got a couple minorities in chains like, there's dark forces at work. Yeah, it's called, I am bad, and they know I'm bad. It's called the radio show, Shane. Oh, it's, uh, man. To this nope. day. I uh, I'm just saying. I think if if you expect me to, be I can't here, even read this text. What is wrong with people? If you, I'm gonna tell you right now, live on television. If you expect me to be your Encyclopedia Britannica and to be like, well, I know that Lee Elder was actually the first. Why black. the voice though? <laughs> that, that, why the voice? Like, what is going on? That's the well, actually, guy voice, and like. I don't know what to tell you. I was making a joke that Augusta National's racist. That's it. That was the whole bit. Oh, I wasn't <laughs> exactly. He's totally lost it these last yeah. four minutes. <laughs> if you got a lead on Sunday at the Masters, you can't leave to have a kid. I'm sorry. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. And you bet your ass if I'm Wyndham Clark, I am getting that jacket fitted like I was leading pole to pole. I don't – listen, there was like – I think it was the 1904 Olympics. Oh. Like one guy finished that marathon. Everybody else like, – guess what? He still got a gold medal, and I would wear that thing proudly. It Some guy came like over – a huge waste of time. <laughs> Some guy came over from Russia with, with no food, and basically he was wearing like, like slacks and Oxford shoes trying to run this marathon. And I think he accidentally ingested some arsenic, and I think he got second. Are you not entertained? Just keep showing up, DB. You get yourself a gold medal. You get yourself a green jacket. And guess what? It all counts the same. Oh, man. No asterisks in these record books, baby. None. So what if it's like on the last hole, like on Saturday, and he leaves and he doesn't play eighteen? Does he? Does he? Uh, does why he, are you putting the quarter in? Doesn't love the game. I, I mean, I'm just is curious. He, does he like, just get a standard? Does, like, do you need curacy? Does he get like ten strokes on him, and then he doesn't, can just play on Sunday? Doesn't love the game. Or does doesn't he have, love the game? Or does he have to finish the round out? Because he not could, committed. In theory, he could come back and tally up the scorecard like the next day. Hey, distracted. You know what? Mean, insensitive person would probably finish. Dan Hurley. <laughs> Dan Hurley would right Dan now? Hurley would finish. Well, probably because he's apparently got the most complicated offense in the history of mankind, so he'd have to finish because nobody else could possibly figure out how to run a motion offense. Oh. You know, I think I figured out the problem with that since we're just doing all the things that I'm mad about today. Um, I think I figured out the issue that people have with not understanding that his offense isn't that complicated. If you look at his offense and go, those are sets and set plays, then it is incredibly complicated. But I'm almost positive it's motion offense, right? So it looks complicated because they've got all these different looking things. And they're like, oh, he's got the deepest playbook in the world. And it's like, nope, they run motion. It's called a motion offense. It's going to look a lot different a lot of times. Sometimes it's going to look simple. And then I saw some guy, I think it was Ryan Casty on Twitter. I think he does some big East Coast nation bias, whatever, I don't know, whatever it is. And he goes, he goes, it's the deepest, most complex playbook we've ever seen. But against Purdue, he went really simple. It's like, no, Purdue didn't defend it well, so they were able to do the first read. Hello, friend. It's called the motion offense. You read, and then you react. If they don't defend it well, then it looks like you're running simple stuff because it's your first read. It's like a quarterback when you're reading a defense. If your first guy is always open, doesn't really look that complex, and, does and, it? And still People somehow they the only shot shot 45% from the floor. And six of 22. Most complex offense I've ever seen in my life. 
I, I do want to know if you're going to be okay. I'm fine. Uh, I'm we fine. Sure? You seem very hurt right now. You're going to you're going to be all right. I just I know I'm going to get I know I'm getting because of the last like two minutes there. I know I'm going to get in the group text and they're just going to they just keep sending me Twitter videos of people <laughs> saying, look how complex this offense is. And I go, you know, I didn't reach my opinion because I hadn't seen it. Right. <laughs> Oh. I care about you. Here's some pine cones on the stick. I, I, yeah, exactly. I want to go get you some pine. Screen, cut, counter. That's it. That's the whole offense. Sometimes it gets initiated with the ball screen. Sometimes it gets initiated with the dribble handoff. And, and, and that's about it. I'm not going to die on this hill, but I will say this. I do think. That I'm 100% unequivocally right. I do think I don't love the screen grabs to validate because I think a lot of times people gravitate towards low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Look no further than the quarterback discussion we've had over the last couple of days. Yep. Somebody says it, it looks a certain way. We regurgitate it without really looking at what it is. Mm -hmm. So that can definitely be a thing. I'm not saying it's, in this case, oh no, these are videos. They're sending me videos. But just because people do that doesn't make it true. It just means of the 30 people that you may grab it from, there may be another 300 mm -hmm. that don't agree. You know, 30 could seem like a lot. I've got, I've got, I've got some video or some audio yeah. of uh, when uh, Scotty leaves and Robbie's out there. Uh -huh. Like you're winning. You're winning it like you're winning. No, he's not winning at life because he's leaving. I'm just saying, like, four of the video clips were just Alex Caravan slipping screens. That's all it was. It's just like, hey, I'm about to set the screen. They overplayed it. JK, I'm going to the hoop. And they get layups, and they're like, oh, my God. It's the most complex offense I've ever seen in my life. It's a slip screen. Why are those guys in your fringe group? I don't know. I don't know why they like me, honestly. I like them because they're pretty cool. But I'm kind of a jerk, so I don't really know. I don't know why a lot of people talk to me, to be honest. But I do know now. You can wear that coat with pride. But. Just like the green jacket, baby. Uh, I do know now, though, thank you, that Tiger, Tiger Woods wasn't the first black man to play Augusta. So we learned that on the show today. Also, OJ Simpson's dead. RIP. Uh, that's TV. I'm Robbie Lula. We'll probably be back tomorrow. It's hard to say. It's heard on Sports Radio.